We are live. The Senate has reconvened in our virtual format. Uh, Madam Secretary, any communications or reports? Communications from the clerk of the house and request a sponsorship. The House wishes to inform the Senate that it has passed Senate Bill Number 191, Senate Substitute for Senate Bill Number 243, Senate Bill Number 249, House Bill Number 352, House Bill Number 354, House Bill Number 355, Senate Bill Number 223, Senate Bill Number 227, Senate Bill Number 237, Senate Bill Number 240. Senate Joint Resolution Number Two, Senate Joint Resolution Number Three, House Bill Number Three Fifty One, House Bill Number Three Fifty Three, Senate Bill Number Two Zero One with Senate Amendment One, Senate Substitute for Senate Bill Number Two Twenty Nine, Senate Bill Number Two Thirty Six, Senate Bill Number Two Forty Five, Senate Bill Number One Seventy, Senate Bill Number Two Ten. Senate Substitute 1 for Senate Bill Number 239, Senate Bill Number 244, Senate Bill Number 246, Senate Bill Number 247, Senate Bill Number 248, Senate Bill Number 251, Senate Bill Number 253, House Bill Number 350, House Substitute 1 for House Bill 348 with House Amendment 1. Requests of sponsorship to Joy Bauer, Secretary of the Senate from Rich Puffer, Chief Clerk of the House. The following members of the House of Representatives re respectfully request their names to be added as House co-sponsors of Senate Bill number 191. Representative John Viola, Representative William Bush, Representative Krista Griffith, Representative Michael Ramon, Representative Kim Williams, Representative Lyndon Yurick, thank you for your attention to this request. Please do not hesitate to contact me should you have any questions. To Joy Bauer, Secretary of the Senate from Rich Puffer, Chief Clerk of the House. Representative Ray Siegfried respectfully requests his name to be added as a House co-prime sponsor of Senate Bill Number 191. Joy Bauer, Secretary of the Senate from Rich Puffer, Chief Clerk of the House. Representative Paul, uh, Paul Bomback respectfully requests his name to be added as a House co-sponsor of Senate Bill number 253. Joy Bauer, Secretary of the Senate from Richard Puffer, Chief Clerk of the House. Representative Kim Williams respectfully requests her name to be added as a House co-prime sponsor of Senate Bill number 223. Madam President, this concludes the reading of the communication of the House and the requests of sponsorship. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Secretary. Madam Secretary, any additional communications or reports? Uh, the Delaware State Senate, President Pro Tempore's list of pre-filed legislation, session two, read to the Senate record, July 24th, 2020. Madam Senator, President. Yes, yeah, Senator McBride. May so much be considered reading a pre file. So moved. Any other communications, Madam Secretary? No, not at this time, Madam President. If not, we will turn to you, Senate Majority Leader, Senator Poor. Thank you, Madam President. At this time, I move the Senate adjourn until Thursday, the 25th of June at 3.07. The Senate is adjourned. The Senate will come to order. Members and guests, please be in a mindset of prayer at this moment. We're going to turn to our Senator Brown for his prayer. And after that, join us, please, in the Pledge of Allegiance. Senator Brown. Loving Father, your presence is with us, even when we become busy and momentarily forget about you. Thank you for continually breaking through the barriers of insensitivity with overtures of your love. Sometimes we go for hours without thinking of you or asking for your help. We are, you are our closest friend, as well as our God. Help us to keep that friendship in good working order. Lord, you know us. 
we get so absorbed in our activities and begin to think we are capable of functioning without you, your peace and power. Show us the mediocrity of our efforts without your intervention and inspiration. We dedicate this day to live for your glory and by your grace, sustained by your goodness. You are our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you, members. Now we'll have our pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Madam Secretary, please take attendance roll call. Senator Panini. Here. Here. Senator Brown. Present. Present. Senator Cloutier. Present. Present. Senator Del Colo. Present. Present. Senator Ennis. Here. Here. Senator Hansen. Here. Here. Senator Hawker. Present. Present. Senator Lawson. Present. Present. Senator Lockman. Here. Here. Senator Lopez. Here. Here. Senator McBride. Here. Here. Senator McDowell. Here. Here. Senator Pardee. Present. Present. Senator Pettyjohn. Present. Present. Senator Poor. Here. Senator Richardson. Present. Present. Senator Sokola. Here. Here. Senator Sturgeon. Here. Here. Senator Townsend. Here. Here. Senator Walsh. Present. Present. Senator Wilson. Present. Present. Madam President, the attendance roll call, 21 present. Our being present, the Senate is now in session. Madam Secretary, minutes from our previous day, please. June 23rd, 2020. Senator Poor. Thank you, Madam President. I move so much be considered the reading of the minutes. So moved. Senator Poor. Thank you, Madam President. At this time, we're going to focus on the agenda, and I will yield to Senator McBride for House Bill 346. Senator McBride, to you, sir. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, at this time, I would like to request that House Bill 346 with House Amendment Number 5 be brought before the Senate for consideration, please. Mr. Assistant Secretary, would you kindly read in House Bill 346 as amended by House Amendment 5? House Bill number 346 with House Amendment 5, sponsored by Representative Longhurst, Representative Schwarzkopf, Representative Mitchell, Representative Brady, Senator McBride, and others. An act to amend Title 15 of the Delaware Code relating to voting by mail for the 2020 non-presidential primary, general, and special elections. Madam President, this concludes the reading of House Bill number 346 with House Amendment 5 by title only. House Bill 346 is amended with House Amendment 5 before the Senate. Senator McBride. Madam President, uh, thank you so much. Madam President and uh, members of the Senate, I know I don't need to remind anyone that we are currently living through the greatest public health crisis of the last 100 years. Coronavirus has changed how we work how we shop, how we interact with family and friends, and even how the Delaware General Assembly conducts business. I am speaking to you remotely right now because we recognize our obligation to protect the public from the serious and legitimate risk of spreading the virus by having all of us, not only our members, but also the large number of Delawareans who come to Legislative Hall each day. Voting in person carries many of the same COVID-19 risks. And because it is the fundamental cornerstone of our democracy, we have a moral obligation to provide our constituents, particularly those with a heightened risk of contracting COVID-19 with safe, secure options to cast their ballots. This is not some imaginary hypothetical concern. We've all seen reports of polling stations in other places staffed with too many volunteers 
and overloaded with voters waiting their turn to exercise their constitutional right. Just this last month here in Delaware, myself and voters in the Christiana School District referendum had to wait two or three hours to cast their ballots because of the extra time it took to ensure the voting booths were safe. And as I say, I was one of those voters standing in line a little longer than I could have ever imagined. In that instance, each polling site averaged 930 voters. The last time we had a presidential election in 2016, the polling sites averaged over a thousand voters. If nothing changes, we will have an average of over a thousand Delawareans showing up to vote in person this fall at each polling place, just as the CDC says we might see another spike in COVID-19 cases. This is what I would call a recipe for disaster. And because of this uncertainty, we must prepare for it. Thankfully, House Bill 346 that is now before us proposes a simple, safe and secure solution to this problem. By passing this bill today, we will be doing nothing more than expanding the absentee ballot system for 2020 primary and general elections and special elections that have existed in this state for decades. That's it. This simply mirrors the same vote by mail system utilized for decades in Delaware by members of the military, overseas residents, people with disabilities, and even voters out of town on business or vacation. Under House Bill 346, for the 2020 elections and 2020 only, the Delaware Department of Elections will mail an application, not a ballot, but an application for a ballot to every qualified voter in our state. In the general election, that includes Democrats, Republicans, unaffiliated voters, members of the Green Party, Libertarian Party, even the 103 members of the Blue Enigma Party. Voters would then have the option, I repeat again, the option of filling out the application and mailing it back to the Department of Elections using a prepaid postage. Those voters and those voters alone would then receive an absentee ballot that would allow them to vote without ever having to set foot in a crowded polling site. This point, I also want to make very, very clear. House Bill 346 would not, I say again, House Bill 346 would not eliminate in-person polling sites or prevent a single registered voter in this state from casting a ballot in person. The idea here is to offer more options, not less. No one should ever have to choose between their health and voting in a free and open election. The Delaware Constitution provides us with the power to make sure they never have to. Instead, it grants us, the General Assembly, the power to adopt measures that ensure the continuity of governmental operations in times of emergency resulting from disease. This is certainly a situation we face this year and elections are nothing if not the ultimate continuity of government operations. Furthermore, federal funds through the CARES Act have been granted to our State Department of Elections through the U.S. Elections Assistant Commission for exactly this purpose, coronavirus issues related to the 2020 elections. To my colleagues, I believe we have a legal and moral responsibility to take action today to protect the health of our constituents while making sure their right to vote in the 2020 elections is protected. No one should ever have to choose between their health and voting in a free and open election. With us today, we're honored to have Anthony Albents, our state election commissioner, to speak to the bill, outline the process, and answer any questions that my colleagues may have. Madam President, at this time, I would like to request without objection the personal privilege 
for our election commissioner, Mr. Albenz, who will talk about what the legislation does in particular situations. And thank you. Is Mr. Albenz with us? Sir? Senator McBride, thank you. We will turn to him. One, two quick items um, while you're, um, pr we're presenting. We are under suspension of rules and Senator Bonini is with us. Um, you just aren't able to see his picture. He's communicated with me. So he is present um, and he wanted to us to relay. And as presiding officer, I've agreed that that's okay. He's having issues with his camera, but for the record, for those listening in, he is with us. So Senator McBride, you've asked for personal privilege, uh, personal privilege and seeing no objection, personal privilege granted um, to Mr. Anthony Albanese. Mr. Albanese? Mr. President, uh, Madam President, yes. Mr. Albanese, thank you so much for being available this afternoon. <clears throat> if you could, please, sir, would you take us through what exactly we can expect when the governor signs this bill into law. And, and uh, then yes, members, Mr. Olvance, uh, I know you testified in the House, and then I would like to offer any uh, members, they may have questions for you, if you could enter, entertain their questions, please. Thank you, Madam sure. President. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator, and good afternoon, Senators and, and uh, all who are joining us today. Um, Senator, per your, uh, your uh, request, what would happen um, if the, um, bill goes into effect is that, as you mentioned, um, applications mailed to qualified individuals, these would be dem registered Democrats and Republicans in the primary and all el eligible voters in the, the general election. These applications would be, as you mentioned, for, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a vote by mail ballot. Um, and I do wanna uh, also um, uh, re-emphasize what you mentioned, that this would be an option for voters, all polling places that would be the usual polling places would be open, and vo voters would have that option certainly to vote there uh, in person if if they so desire. Um, just getting back to the process, once an application would be completed by a voter if they chose to do so, it would be sent back in a postage paid envelope, as you mentioned. One, it would be received by the appropriate county election office. It would be processed there by staff and the staff that are um, in the offices will verify um, the information that is provided on the application as they are um, it, as they go through the procedure of making sure that that is accurate, entering that into our systems, our voter registration systems, noting if any updates are needed or have been requested as well. Um, once the applications are successfully uh, completed and entered into our system, then uh, we have um, processes that occur within our election management systems, whereby the appropriate ballot would be generated for the voter, just as in the current absentee process. Of course, in the primary election, that would be a, a party specific ballot. Um, in the general election, of course, it would be open uh, with multiple parties, any of the parties that have ballot access and have candidates. Um, and those would be, would be uh, mailed out to the voters. Um, again, with uh, regarding postage, the return postage is, is paid for the return uh, vote by mail ballot envelope as it is currently with absentee. So the voters never have to uh, affix postage um, to the envelope. Um, once the ballots are mailed um, out to the voters, of course, the, vo the voters will have an instructional uh, brochure included as well as the ballot and the return envelope. Uh, once the, the voters have completed the ballot and, and sent the ballot back mm -hmm. to us, then the process that happens um, at that point is that when the ballot is received back at the appropriate elections office, it is uh, checked in. One of the things that we're doing, and I wanted to mention this as, as well, and you reference, Senator McBride referenced the CARES Act uh, funding that we have been um, appropriated by the, uh, via the Election Assistance Commission. Even in, a, even in advance of this legislation uh, and the legislation in the House, in light of the current environment and the, and the uh, situation with COVID-19, we anticipated there would be a very significant increase in absentee voting and voting and or you know, voting by mail. Um, and we certainly have, have seen that happen. So in light of that um, and utilizing some of the uh, funds allocated, we are in the process and are continuing to look at how we can augment our equipment 
and um, automate as much of the process as possible, uh, obtaining equipment such as very high speed ballot sorters and scanners, um, other equipment to help us in the mail preparation process because you know traditionally absentee has been uh, a manual process and certainly we're scaling that up and have done so um, and have had to do so very you know very quickly. Um, but getting back to the process, uh, once the uh, ballots are received back uh, into the appropriate county office, um, they are checked in. Part of the check-in process is ensuring that the ballot um, is appropriately sealed, that the oath or affirmation has been signed by the voter. Um, and then the, the ballots, um, received ballots are then sorted um, via the sorting equipment that we have or previously you know, manually. The ballots are sorted into the appropriate um, districts, um, representative districts and election districts. Uh, which allow them to then be checked in and then our voter registration system appropriately updated to show status. We have already, and I know this bill includes, and we have already in our system uh, a tool that allows the voter to um, track the status of their ballot, uh, whether a ballot has been requested, sent, or received. So that is sort of information is fed back into the system to provide that update that the voter is able to access or our staff is able to access if contacted by a voter. So that's the first step uh, in the process and um, the ballots you know, that are then received are then stored securely until the time that we begin sorting and tabulation. So I'll move on to that now. Um, I know this legislation, for example, and, and, and I think appropriately so, um, provides additional time for the offices to begin the process of, of sorting the ballots and preparing them for scanning and tabulation, which will be very important um, given the increase in volume. So moving to that step, um, after the ballots have been stored securely, when it comes time for them to be uh, scanned and tabulated, they are then um, removed from the secure locations. Um, the uh, time when the ballots are prepared uh, as they are currently with the absentee process are considered public meetings, which are posted and members of the public, um, members of uh, representatives of political parties, anyone who is interested may attend uh, those sessions as well. That's also the uh, opportunity during that time. Certainly if there are any challenges that wish to be presented, if there are any individuals who have a challenge uh, who wish to, to lodge such a challenge, that would be the opportunity, you know, certainly for them to do so. Um, they would, uh, my, my suggestion on that, the normal procedure on that is that the uh, individual would make contact with either the county director or deputy director who would be supervising the process and make them aware of that because again of the large volume, you know, we're dealing with. Um, these meetings would be posted and would be ongoing meetings. They wouldn't be a single time, you know, even in the traditional absentee environment, uh, in a presidential year, these preparations can last over the, uh, several days. And as mentioned in this bill, you have, we have up to 30 days. So these could be happening over the course of you know, two weeks, 14 days, 15, 16 days. So these will be ongoing meetings that'll be posted, adjourned and reconvened as needed you know, each day. So there'll be opportunities for challenges along the way if there are any. Uh, what will happen at that point, getting back to process is again, the ballots will be removed from the secure uh, location, uh, storage location. Uh, bipartisan teams are assembled in the office. Uh, those include staff from the elections office. Uh, those include other individuals whom the offices um, hire. These could be various individuals such as poll workers, experienced poll workers. These could be support staff that we have in the field on election day. We've had retired election um, staff you know, who've retired from the department, who've come back, you know, have expertise, any, any sorts of, of folks. Um, the teams are always bipartisan. They, they each are presented by the, you know, the management of the office, the directors, um, the appropriate ballots that they, will be, um, that they will be reviewing. And what happens at that process is that, um, again, you know, challenges are, are, are considered, as I mentioned. Um, the ballots are um, then viewed again and are, are, there is another reconciliation process that takes place. Any challenges that may be lodged uh, would be handled certainly before the ballot is opened 
And if that is the case, uh, that ballot um, that is potentially challenged would be isolated and it would be referred to the county directors there for their internal review. So we certainly have our um, legal counsel, our deputy attorneys general available if anything needs to be reviewed for that level of review of, review of appropriate. Um, but assuming there's no challenge and assuming um, ballots are, are checked appropriately, um, they uh, then are opened. Ballots are immediately separated from the ballot envelopes once that final check is completed. And um, always like to let folks know that because that maintains the anonymity of the voter, which of course is very, very important. And we never want the voter's ballot to be associated with them in any way. Um, once they are, uh, are opened um, in a uh, primary or general election, um, presidential primary, not as much, um, the ballots would be opened and flattened. I know that sounds like a very kind of pedestrian sort of thing, but it has to happen. Um, certainly in the, the primary election, you're talking about a 14 inch ballot in the general election, it's usually a 17 inch ballot. So they need to be flattened because they're folded in the envelopes to ensure the scanning equipment can tabulate them appropriately. Um, so once that's done and kind of those kind of housekeeping rules are done, um, part of the process as well during this step of the, of the preparation is that um, we examine any ballots to determine if there need to be any remakes. And what we mean by remakes are if there are any extraneous marks on the ballot, if there are any uh, marks that would not be readable by the tabulation equipment, uh, again, under the, uh, under the supervision of the county directors and deputy directors by bipartisan teams, usually distinct bipartisan teams, any ballot that would need to be remade are done so verified by the, the management in the office, and we then move forward. So I'll give you an example. Um, an individual, and this happens a fair amount, individual circles the name of the candidate versus filling in the oval, not readable by the equipment. So um, that type of situation presents itself. Um, again, that ballot would be referred by those processing it to a bipartisan remaking team. The original ballot um, is, is uh, remade onto a, uh, a new blank ballot. There is a system, uh, a numbering system that is kept and there are logs kept of this so that there can always, again, this is way past the time, of course, the ballots have been separated from the voter information. There is uh, the opportunity then to always reconcile that for audit purposes. If we have 50 ballots that maybe have extraneous marks, 50 ballots corresponding, they can always be reconciled together based on um, numbers that are written on the outside edges of it. Again, just want everybody to know the process on that, that there is validation there. Um, so once any remakes are made and everything is determined to be ready to, uh, to tabulate, we go to the ballot scanners. And that's another piece of equipment that we have augmented with the current level of funding. We, we have additional multiple high-speed scanners in each, uh, in each office. We have augmented uh, what we have in place uh, not just for backup purposes, but for capacity purposes. Um, once the ballots are ready, they are scanned into the into the ballot scanners and tabulators. And this is um, in, I know it's in this current bill, it's in the current uh, code as well. Of course, uh, even though we have this advanced preparation time, the ballot are uh, never tabulated until the close of polls. They are scanned never tabulated until eight o'clock on election night. So no one ever knows the results. And it's also important to remember, um, and I should have mentioned this a minute ago, I apologize, that any of these individuals who are involved in this process of ballot preparation do take an oath before they begin. And part of that oath is that nothing that they see in this process will be revealed to anyone uh, because again, Although we take many precautions, we never want there to be any, any anonymity of a voter compromised or anything that people see in terms of numbers compromised. Oh, I saw this, I saw that, you know, no. And people take that very seriously. You know, over the years I've seen, you know, we have a lot of very experienced people. They really do take that seriously. So I wanna assure folks of that. So just jumping back to scanning, we were at the scanning process. Again, that will continue over the course of, you know, multiple days. Um, and then once we get to um, election day and election night, and the final ballots have then been opened and prepared and scanned, then we begin tabulation. And literally that is once the polls close, hit the tabulation number, 
you get your results, and then we, we continue the processes we normally have to prepare that information to be uploaded securely as part of the unofficial election results. After everything's done and really through the whole process, everything, um, all the ballots then are um, re-secured um, after they have been prepared and scanned, placed again in secure storage under the authority of the um, directors of each county department. Um, and again, those are, are kept on file certainly for um, any audit purposes or certainly if there were any needs for any recounts or anything like that, you know, after the fact. I did mention earlier just a little bit that we do have the, um, the logging and the voter registration system so that information uh, is available to voters and certainly to our staff. Um, and just one last thing, if I could, then I'll stop, is um, in reference to um, the, how this interaction happens between absent, excuse me, vote by mail and the polling plates, just so everyone knows that. Probably from, from everyone's experience, of course, over the years, we all um, remember the traditional paper poll lists that we had had in the polling places. Those poll lists always had notations on there for absentee ballots in the, the absentee system. They would have one of two notations. They would have a notation that an absentee ballot was sent and not returned, or that an absentee ballot was returned. And our new voting equipment, which is the electronic poll box, have uh, more advanced you know, versions of that. Um, unlike the poll lists, which of course could only be updated through physically um, annotating the list, writing on the list, um, the elections office calling polling places to update them during the day as ballots may be returned with late ballots, if you will, not literally late, but coming in on election day, those types of ballots. Um, the poll books can be automated, we have an automated system to update them as well. Um, and they include that same information that of absentee or a, or a vote by mail ballot has been sent or has been received. If a ballot has been sent to a voter and not returned and that voter, you know, that voter shows up at the polling place, the process of the, the poll workers are instructed on this, they are to contact the county elections office. The county elections office will void that ballot that absentee or the vote by mail ballot, depending on the type of ballot it is. And then that voter will be allowed to vote at the polling place. So if by chance that ballot were to come in, say it was the morning of election day, it came in in the mail later on, on election day, that ballot would, if someone attempted to scan that in in the office would come up void, not be able to be counted. If on the other hand, the voter has already returned their ballot by mail and they present themselves at a polling place, it'll be noted as such that they have already voted and they will not be allowed to vote at the polling place. So there is that level of control uh, in the system so just to, to make everybody aware of that. So that's kind of well, a, an overview uh, of, the, of the process kind of in brief. Mr. Albens, uh, I, I thank you so very much. Uh, I know that in uh, many detailed discussions we have had previously, um, I expected that you would have these things to say, but uh, I will say that, you know, you have uh, planned sufficiently and have seemed to covered all the per potential issues that might come up. I'm sure that there will be members that may have questions for you. Madam President, maybe the- uh, Yes. Uh, my yes, colleagues so I have may been, have questions. Um, taking notes um, here and I have had two hands so far, Senator Pettyjohn followed by Senator Hawker. Senator Pettyjohn. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And uh, Anthony, thank you for, for coming and explaining the process. I mean, it's a, it's a very involved process. Uh, you know, I wish there was a flow chart involved there or a PowerPoint or something so we could follow it visually. But, um, you know, I know it's a, it's a very involved process for that. Just a few questions about, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the, some of the more final de finer details of the process. Um, as in the primary election, the presidential primary that's scheduled, will any voter be able to vote at any, any in-person polling place within the county for the general? Um, Senator, yeah, to your question, that, that was in place for the presidential primary and that came under, um, with the provisions of the governor's order where there was a minimum number of places and we're actually operating many more you know, than the required minimum. For that type, for that election and in that situation, we are 
how a, having voters vote at any polling place, our system has the capability of doing that. For the primary and the general though, we will have the normal polling places open. So voters will have the normal quantity of polling places open so, and they will report to their usual polling place. So every polling place, their, their normal polling places for the September primary and the general will be open. Right. The only issues that we could possibly encounter, and this has happened more, more so a few instances in Newcastle County, is there are polling places at some senior living facilities and at some senior care facilities, and they actually have requested that we relocate them. Sure. Um, and we, you know, as we normally do, notify the voters in that case. But certainly, you know, we honor their request. You know, they've asked us, and we certainly will make. And we've been able to accommodate those changes with places close by. Okay. Generally, so that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're talking about security, and you had mentioned that when you receive the completed ballot or the, yeah, the completed yep. ballot, um, mm -hmm. you know, you, you look and make sure it's signed by the voter. How mm -hmm. are you comparing? Are you actually looking at the voter signature on file electronically and, and seeing if it matches, or are you just looking for a signature? And then if there's a challenge, you actually look at the comparison between the signatures. Right. Uh, the I know this current legislation and currently this current state law does not require signature verification, but um, we do have many voter signatures on file, um, thanks to our longtime affiliation with DMV mm -hmm. and with other state agencies. So that can be a an option, as you mentioned, for um, if we have an issue, if there's a potential challenge or a question, that can be a, re a point of reference. And they, those are um, in our system, so we do have them available as okay. well. They're electronically presented in our voter registration system. And this is, is the ballot going to be different for the vote by mail versus um, versus absentee? Um, the, no, the appearance of the ballot would, would basically be the same because it's going to be uh, processed on the same equipment. Okay. In but, the same format, basically. But it uh, is fillable. Like yeah, it is going to be treated as a vote by mail ballot, not an absentee ballot within the system. Right, right, exactly. And um, but the the mechanics of it are very, you know basically the same in terms of how they're scanned and tabulated and all okay. the appearance. Mm -hmm. and, and I and I, and I think uh, there's some other questions from my colleagues, and I'll let them get to theirs. But I'll just do one final question. Um, mm -hmm. In the primary, in the presidential primary, the mailing that you did. Uh, how, what percentage of mail was returned um, by the post office? So when you sent out the, the application to right. all registered Democrats, all registered Republicans, yes. what was the return rate on that mail? Um, approximately uh, about 7%, approximately 7%. And we will use those as uh, for voter, excuse me, we will use those for, for address verification processes because that'll get us, we always look for any sort of return mail um, because that helps us with the um, address verification process. We need those two pieces of return mail and the, the two not voting in two elections with federal offices, which is basically two general elections before folks can be removed. So that's helpful. We get that from the post office. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and and we did get, um, I guess, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sir. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say in terms of a number, actually what I, I realized last week, um, we were talking in the, in the, um, in the Senate, or excuse me, in the House rather, um, that qu question was asked about items that were returned. And I think there was a misunderstanding maybe on my part. I had given a number, but I wanted to actually give everyone an update just in general. At that time, there were 55,000 requests that had come in, mm -hmm. not, not returned items, but 55,000 requests that had come in. For applications and as of today just to give everybody an update the latest number i just received were up to seventy-two thousand uh okay. requests for absentee ballots which is you know enormous compared to what we normally would have for a presidential primary i mean right. just you know, sc scales higher and, and and one just final related to a question that that you had answered before but i just kind of uh, i i had another thought on it when you when you're saying you you actually you verify the voter if you're not doing it by signature at that point in time how are you actually verifying the voter we're checking that um all the uh, any information that that's provided by the voter is matching what we have on file 
And if, you know, if there are any discrepancies or anything like that, um, those would be things that would be checked and would be referred to like a supervisor, okay. anything like that for further research, possibly contacting the voter if there's a question about something, okay. you know, that, because um, we know anything that looks unusual, you know, out of the ordinary. Okay. Madam President, uh, no more for the witness. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Senator Hawker is next. Senator Hawker of the witness. Thank you, Madam President, and thanks for uh, such a good address uh, prior to this vote. Uh, I know you had a lot of questions mailed in that the GOP had, and you did a great job answering those. And one question I was a little bit confused on, they're going to be assorted by rep districts and election mm -hmm. districts. Uh, mm -hmm. Are the rep districts uh, define as to what portion of those districts. I know most of them have like eight precincts in those rep districts. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the equipment, actually our sorting equipment and, and even this new sorting equipment we have um, that kind of replaces what we did manually, they will be, um, they can be programmed to do that. We'll do levels of sorting on the ballots that come in. So they'll sort them initially by rep district and then down to the ED level. So, and we have lists that we have through the voter registration system. That's part of those lists that I mentioned that we match them up to, to verify this ballot that came in, you know, we have this ballot physically after it's checked in. And I know they'll be scanned by the district, but where is that scanning gonna take place? Those are in the county offices and those will happen as part of those public meetings. They'll be part of those public meetings that overall preparation, of the ballots, so if anyone can come in and observe that process. And scan prior to election day? Right, yes. So you could go into the Sussex County office, for example, and you know when they're having those and, and basically observe that and see everything going on. Okay, thanks, Brian. I asked the, the other questions I had, so thanks. Right. Sure, welcome, Sam. Thank you, Senator. I do not see any other hands raised. Oh, I do now. Um, Senators Richardson, then back to Senator Patty John. Senator Richardson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and I thank you for uh, taking our questions. Um, do you know of any circumstances where you would have to close some of the polling places? The um, Senator, the only instance um, that I could think of would be if there was a true either an emergency or some place that perhaps pulled out at the last minute for something like that. And I know we really try to avoid doing that as much as possible. Um, I think that, and I know never say never, but I think that the locations that have uncertainty about hosting a polling place have already let us know. And like I said, I think those instances pretty much have been up in Newcastle, like those senior facilities, and they told us pretty early on that they would prefer not to be. So the only thing I can think of if there was a true emergency, you know, someplace wasn't available uh, for some reason. Um, and we really you know, try to um, communicate with the polling places. And a lot of them, since we've been in them for a long time, we have a good relationship with the management there or the owners. And we ask them to please let us know as soon as possible if they anticipate any problem and they would need to change because we want to have plenty of time to notify folks. But thankfully, not too many have, have canceled. Again, it's been a relatively small number, thankfully. Okay, so the ones that have canceled, you have uh, another polling place? Yes, and they're predominantly, yeah, pretty much just in, not, pretty much in Newcastle County. There's about four, four or so up there that that occurred. And again, they were most of those senior facilities. You know, there, or, or there's, problem, there's always been a problem with any election with people showing up at the polls, going to the wrong polls and having to be redirected. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to notify the voters uh, uh, as far as any changes in the polling places? Sure. Any of the voters that are impacted by a change would be notified by a mailing um, and they would be told um, what the new location would be. And if it would just be, you know, for, and usually, usually the mailing would indicate um, if it was just for this election, for example, and it would uh, be just a real succinct mailing, but it would be something that says your normal polling location is not available. You will be voting, you know, here versus there. So they are, they do get notified of a change. Okay. Since and we also update our systems and all. 
think as well, you know, online as well. Since the plan is to have all the polling places open, mm -hmm. would you object to any amendments to guarantee that they would be open or to specify that they would be open? Uh, well, I, certainly that's your, you know, your pleasure, of course, uh, but I, we, that is definitely what we're planning to do is to move forward and have everything available. We don't, we really do not like to change polling places. It's actually more of a challenge for us whenever we change polling places or don't even, if we don't offer as many, just because it's a lot of extra work notifying the voters. <laughs> so we definitely don't have any intention of doing that, okay. of making any changes. But you wouldn't object to us putting it on the record? No, I certainly respect the question, and I'm happy to offer that answer that we will. You know, that's our definitely our planning to open them all up. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, we have Senator Pettyjohn, then Senator Townsend. Senator Pettyjohn. Thank you, Madam President. Anthony, thank you again. Um, let me ask you this one last question. I'm, I'm not going to Columbo this all, all day. Um, <laughs> this is my last question for you. Um, Will votes that are postmarked before election day, but received after election day, be counted? Uh, uh, actually, they won't, Senator. The reason being is that our um, Delaware code, we are a vote by vote, a ballot in hand state, if you will. Um, our code requires you to have, we have for the ballot to be back in the office, the county office that issued it by the time of close of polls. So we have to physically have it in hand. And I know this bill also um, does may, does have a requirement for um, ballot drop boxes in our offices and uh, we'll have those as well. So that'll be another convenient option for voters. If they wish to drop it in the office, they'll have a secure location to do so. If they wish to just do it on their own right inside. But okay. we are ballot in hand, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. No more questions. Mm -hmm. Senator Townsend. Thank you, Madam President, um, Commissioner. For, I just want to start off by saying thank you for your accessibility over the past several weeks during very trying times. Um, very, just, it's fantastic to know Delaware Department of Elections continues to be just a professional organization at a time when other states have other kinds of challenges. So I do want to thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I do. I just want to say that statement, frankly. But but Senator Richardson's question just now did want, maybe want to ask a quick question. Uh, I appreciate your statement that you don't intend to. Uh, to make any changes. Um, is it the case then if there is a, a mandate that you don't make any changes, does that put certain kinds of, of rigidity or, or inflexibility on you in a way that might not be optimal with regard to changing conditions that we can't necessarily predict? Well, one of the challenges that, you know, that certainly we always face, uh, and then even in perfect times, uh, if, you, if there are such a thing, is, um, you know, poll workers, of course, obtaining poll workers. We're having, you know, we're having some some challenges uh, with poll workers. Um, you know, some of them tend to be a little more senior, trying to recruit younger folks. And we certainly understand that those who may be at a higher risk, you know, who may, you know, do, do decide not to work. It's not a tremendous challenge right now. We certainly plan to do uh, our outreach to state employees, for example, and things like that a little bit after the state primary, the presidential primary. Um, but, um, you know, it probably, you know, I don't, um, I won't kid you that it will be a challenge probably to staff everywhere in this, especially in light of this, but we, you know, we are committed to doing that and certainly whatever the Senate's pleasure is, you know, we'll follow. Um, definitely. Well, I understood that. I definitely appreciate your follow the pleasure of the, of the legislature. I guess, again, the point though, being that you're, you're, you're pledging to continue to do this the way you guys have, have always done in a professional manner. Uh, but the you know one one who thinks that just merely codifying that is therefore so simple might actually end up causing significant implementation challenges. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, there are something else comes up. Uh, right, right. You you're right. I mean, certainly if there was a, a resurgence or something like that, right? You know, God forbid if there was you know mass illness event, you know, right. Okay, I just want to, just want to clarify that. You know, appreciate it. People's ever to get the things on the record. I thought it's important to get that that point on the record too. Thank you very much. Senator Jill Del Callo, then Senator Ennis, then Senator Richardson in that order. Senator Del Callo. Thank you, uh, Madam President. My question actually focuses around, and thank you also for being here, uh, Mr. Commissioner. So my, my question does revolve around, I think, a legitimate concern that I have heard from some folks up here after their experience at the Christina referendum. Uh, and what I had heard from that situation is that they, that although there was a large reliance on absentee voting, 
in the course of that process that there were nonetheless very long lines and a lot of uh, people waiting to vote in person. And, and that to me definitely raises the concern of a situation where even though uh, we're providing an option if polling places were to be consolidated in some way, that it would undermine the goal of preventing community spread, which is not what I would like to see happen. So in terms of your staffing and how you're managing this, to me, that would be, you know, regardless of whether uh, things that we might vote on today are added to this bill or not, do you have a plan or a process in place that will mitigate any possibility of that occurring? Because I, I really don't want to see even folks who either aren't aware of the mail-in ballot process that we've implemented or, or whoever doesn't get the memo or people who choose to continue to vote in person. And I would really not like to see them uh, uh, in a situation that could be avoided if we, we were very deliberate about mitigating the risk of that. So I just wanted to hear your sure. thoughts about that and whether there's a plan mm -hmm. in place. Yes, no, definitely. And, and, you know, with the situation like the Christina, what, uh, what happened um, in Newcastle at that, at that, at that time, um, planning that, you know, did have a reduced number of place of polling places. Those were, um, and that again was a, you know, I think, you know, certainly contributed to there being longer lines, granted. Um, the, like I said, our, we're, our folks are working very diligently now to, to do our full staffing plan. We've already done, um, the offices have already done all the mailings out to the uh, prospective poll workers. And as I mentioned, we're going to be doing the outreach like to the state employees, outreach to schools, um, again, to look at the uh, getting us to the normal staffing levels. Um, I do think also that, um, you know, with a situation like Christina, where you had a referendum, with, which was a, also a pretty complex ballot, too, I think that was also a contribution. It took uh, quite a while to read the ballot and all. And I know we're going to have a lot. Our ballots normally are much simpler. And, um, you know, the um, having, you know, additional additional machines, additional equipment, additional check-in stations for the poll, poll books, for example, will mitigate that. But our folks, they're all working you know, definitely 100%, 110% to get the staffing there. And again, as I said, we're planning on normal locations, everything open, um, regardless of what, you know, what happens with vote by mail. So, Thank you. So the other question I had is about a, a slightly different topic which has to do with some concerns I heard from some of my voters about getting uh, the wrong ballot or receiving somebody okay. else's ballot. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and is there a control in place or how are we looking into the possibility of a person who's moved getting their application sent to the wrong place and somebody who's either not paying attention or, or even the possibility of somebody who's being unscrupulous filling out a application and getting a ballot that is not theirs. And my question is, you know, what are we looking into for that? Is there a process in place to address that? G given what I had heard about some of those issues, I think that is a legitimate concern as well. And personally, I support the idea of having mail and voting as a public safety measure. Uh, so that's not the reason for me asking this, uh, any sort of concern about the overall merits of having this safety valve, but rather in that particular instance, is there some type of process in place to control for that? Um, well, in terms of the of the, uh, of the applications themselves, there, like I said, we do have checks that happen in um, when the applications are, pro are processed and before they go out. It is, you know, we're trying to do as much as we can to automate it uh, based on the volume. Um, it is largely at this point a manual process of, of, of fulfilling the ballot requests, and we always try to make sure that we have um, quality control or supervisor or someone uh, checking the ballots that go out doing spot checks, you know, ensuring that, you know, the right in the primary, certainly the right party, the right ballot style uh, as well. And there are occasionally do mistakes or, you know, do happen, and I won't, you know, obviously they do, but I'm always trying to do the best in the offices are um, ensuring that supervisors or um, and a manager is checking those ballots or doing spot checks certainly before they go out. Same with applications as well um, to try to mitigate that, make sure there's quality control. And again, a lot of this is we're, as I mentioned, we're look, doing all we can to scale up the processes because of the volume certainly being much higher than we've ever had. 
because then we certainly take you know take that very seriously anytime we don't want anybody getting anything incorrect certainly and and that's definitely you know mm -hmm. certainly we want to have open elections we also want to have uh elections with integrity and i i sure. certainly admire your commitment to that yes. um, so the 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 final question mm -hmm. i had has to do with the type of machines that you're ordering to address mm -hmm. the process myself mm -hmm. and uh my colleague Senator Townsend were involved in a task force right. that really went through a very, very high level of analysis and review to select the new voting machines that we now have. And we focused mm -hmm. on making sure that, that those machines would be very difficult to tamper with. We focused on making yeah. sure that there was a process for the internal integrity of the vote that a person who's casting the vote would be able to confirm, this is actually what my vote is. Uh, we really mm -hmm. put a lot of effort into that. My question is, you know, reading about some of the technology in states that have had mail-in voting for some time, uh, such as, for mm -hmm. example, Utah, there are references to weighing ballots in, uh, you know, micrograms and measuring them mm -hmm. in micrometers, mm -hmm. and really getting down to make sure that we're uh, controlling for any type of untoward uh, behavior. Is that the types of machines you're mm -hmm. referencing when you reference machines right. or other sorts of things that you're looking into? Yes, yes that's right. Um, the machines that we are uh, talking about, the, the more high speed sorters, they have um, you know, multiple layers of control on that. Like you mentioned, Senator, the, the weighing, uh, uh, those are, that's one of the control factors you know, to determine that the, that the ballot, that you're not getting an empty envelope, for example. Um, Imaging the ballot, so we have the uh, you know capturing that to associate that with the voter registration record. Also, picking up if there are any um, discrepancies, such as a missing signature ballot not being uh, ballot not being sealed. You know, again, because you're handling a lot higher volumes than it um, that at a uh, the, the traditional level we've had in the past, which was handled by hand. They have a lot of various levels of control on uh, on them, which is very. Uh, which is very, very helpful and very needed. And again, during that process, like I was mentioning, that we're um, the preparation, which is certainly an open process or meeting, we'll be happy certainly to have anyone um, review the machines. We're welcome to see them. You know, see them. We're just getting some of this equipment in place because it's happening. You know, um, so quickly to view everything and to to demonstrate how that works and the various features of it. I, and I, the Newcastle office has going to have a have a very uh, very sophisticated sorting machine. So, I I really appreciate um, that openness and the willingness to allow for uh, that sort of confirmation. Uh, and and I do appreciate you entertaining my questions. Uh, thank you, sir. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Madam President. Great. Two more at this time. We go to Senator Ennis, and then we'll go to Senator Richardson. Senator Ennis, you'll have to unmute yourself, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, Commissioner, I want to commend you on the fine job you did uh, explaining what this legislation does in regard to uh, the issue of mail-in ballots, as well as the, the description of what goes on at the polling places for those who may choose. Uh, very complete and detailed. But there's one thing I just want to uh, request that you answer. Um, are, is the provisional ballot process still going to be available at the polling places for the state primary and the general election. Is that process still Okay, yes. Yes, that's, it will be centered. Yeah, the provisional ballot process, which um, is required actually in state law and federal law that will continue, continue on uh, unchanged. Per Delaware law, it remains uh, for federal offices only, um, but we will provide that same process as we, as we always have. That will, that will not change at all. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Senator Richardson. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Towson uh, mentioned it might be a significant burden on you mm -hmm. if um, to fulfill the requirements if the um, if we voted to to pass the amendment that I'm going to propose shortly. Um, I can think of no other function of government more important than to make sure that our election process is done in a manner in which everyone has an opportunity to vote and knows where to vote. Uh, I know that you're working really hard to make sure that this uh, takes place. I just wanted to um, 
to ask you, um, you're up to the task, right? I know that you're working hard and uh, I don't think that you know, this would increase uh, the burden on you because I know you're trying to do the best job you can anyway. Is that right? We, we are, and we are doing that. Um, again, you know, the, the challenges um, that we face, you know, we try to plan for as much as we can, certainly. And, um, you know, certainly there's unforeseen, well, of course, all of this was unforeseen, COVID-19 and all was unforeseen. Um, you know, certainly um, the challenges that we could face could be ones we, we aren't even aware of yet in terms of, you know, per, you know, God forbid a resurgence or anything like that. But like I said, we'll, we will certainly continue to do our best and um, uh, recruit as many workers, recruit as many, um, uh, get our facilities up and ready to roll uh, as much as we can. Absolutely. Um, okay. we're hoping everyone stays health, nice and healthy. That's what we're hoping. <laughs> we're hoping. All right, Senator McBride, I don't see any other Madam questions President. of your witness. Senator McBride. Madam President. Yes. Uh, Mr. Albent, so I th yeah. thank you very, very much. I, I do know that there have been some amendments pre-filed and uh, perhaps, Madam President, it would be appropriate at this time to ask uh, those sponsors if they care to bring those forward. And I would uh, request that Mr. Albent uh, stand by, not that he's planning to go anywhere. Uh, because he may be able to help be helpful with the amendments also. Um, Thank Mr. you, Madam Aldin, President. Uh, you are temporarily virtually excused, but remain <laughs> with us, please. Virtually uh, excused, I like that. Yeah, virtually excused, but remain, remain with us. Uh, yes, there are three Senate amendments, and uh, I would yield then I, to Senator Hawker as amendment number one, if he still has his amendments, if they do. Senator Hawker. Thank you, Madam President. I request the reading end of this amendment to uh, come before this body. Okay, Mr. Assistant Secretary, would you kindly read in Senate Amendment 1 to House Bill 346, title only. Senate Amendment number 1 to House Bill number 346, sponsored by Senator Hawker. Madam President, this concludes the reading of Senate Amendment number 1 to House Bill number 346. Senate Amendment Number One before the Senate to House Bill 346, Senator Hocker. Thank you, Madam President. You know, I feel that uh, voting by mail is very important during this COVID virus. Uh, I see like a 500% increase in internet sales. People that don't want to come in the store, people that want to put the groceries in their car, they are scared. They need to be able to vote, you know, by. Uh, mail-in ballots, and I don't want to keep anybody from voting, but I see an awful lot of waste and confusion the way this bill is drafted and the way it is written. You know, you have a fiscal note for over $800,000, and everybody getting an application for a mail-in ballot, I think is going to be waking to a lot of voters that just don't understand the process. And with this, it uh, takes away mail-in and only mails to those that request it the same way they request an absentee today. And the amendment requires the department to make the applications for voting ballots available through multi sources, you know, just not you know, through the mail. And this just uh, takes away a lot of the waste from the taxpayers and a lot of confusion to uh, pass this amendment and add this amendment to the bill. I see no questions or comments. Your pleasure, sir, with your menu asking for a roll call. Roll call. Madam Secretary, would you kindly call roll on Senate Amendment 1 to House Bill 2, 346? Senator Panini. Yes. Yes. Senator Brown. No. No. Senator Cloutier. No. No. Senator Del Colo. Yes. Yes. Senator Ennis. No. No. Senator Hansen. No. No. Senator Hawker. Yes. Yes. Senator Lawson. Yes. Yes. Senator Lockman. No. No. Senator Lopez. Yes. Yes. Senator McBride. No. No. Senator McDowell. No. No. Senator Pardee? No. No. Senator Pettyjohn? Yes. Yes. Senator Poor? 
Yeah. No. Senator Richardson. Yes. Yes. Senator Sokola. No. No. Senator Sturgeon. No. No. Senator Townsend. No. No. Senator Walsh. No. No. Senator Wilson. Yes. Yes. Madam President, the roll call and Senate Amendment 1 to House Bill 346, 8 yes, and 13. Having failed to receive the required and sufficient number of votes, Senate Amendment 1 to House Bill 346 declared defeated. Moving in order of our amendments, normally I would be looking for your hand raise or you would be standing at your desk. Senate Amendment Number 2 to House Bill 346 is your Senator Richardson. You'll need to unmute yourself, sir. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to have that amendment read in, please. Mr. Assistant Secretary, would you kindly read in by title only, Senate Amendment 2 to House Bill 346. Senate Amendment Number 2 to House Bill Number 346, sponsored by Senator Richardson. Madam President, this concludes the reading of Senate Amendment Number 2 to House Bill Number 346. Senator Richardson, Senate Amendment 2 is before to Senate uh, House Bill 346 before the Senate, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, this amendment uh, clarifies that the Department of Elections must maintain at least one polling place in each election district as required under current law for primary, general, and special elections. Um, my son lives in Washington, D.C., happens to be a Democrat. I stood in line for five hours uh, to vote in the primary election in D.C. Uh, he was not able to vote because the polls closed before he was uh, able to get in to get there to vote. And if the election process is going to be slowed down at all, I think it's very important that we don't have to redirect people to other polling places or to have them uh, stand in line for long periods of time. I think we need to make sure that these elect these polling places are open. Okay, I see no hands. Oh, Senator Del Calo, your hand is up, sir. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I just wanted to speak to this amendment briefly. I, I really appreciate the fact that uh, the Elections Department is committed to having uh, polling places maintained. However, that doesn't change the fact that we experienced a serious problem in the recent uh, referendum, perhaps exacerbated by the nature of the ballot, but certainly uh, also exacerbated by the fact that there was uh, actions taken that resulted in there being fewer polling places available. This acts as a safety valve to prevent this from occurring here, where you're going to have far more people voting uh, and in circumstances where the expressed purpose of the bill that's been introduced is to prevent community spread. Uh, it, it says it right there in the synopsis. We want to do this, and we're specifically proposing this to avoid community spread, and clearly, if folks, if, there, if something does happen, if there's a drop off in poll workers, if, if there's any number of unforeseen circumstances that occur, uh, this, this is a, a possibility, perhaps not probable, but possible. And, and since the whole premise of this is to provide a manner for people to vote in the face of a possible research that we're not certain and we hope will not happen, but we're providing this process anyway, even at the same time, mind you, while we had a process before that was very similar to this one that was under operation of executive order from the governor with no action from the General Assembly. So we're doing this to be safe and we're doing this to be sure that there's a safe option. That same logic applies without fail to this amendment. So I really would like my colleagues to consider this I really would like them to support it. We have plenty of time to adjust the bill with this amendment, get it back to the House, uh, and then pass it here. I think this would really uh, be consistent with the purpose of the bill. And so I'm urging all of you to really consider supporting this. 
thank you for your attention. Uh, Madam President, thank you. Senator Townsend, your hand went up, sir. Thank you, Madam President. I'm gonna try to scroll up there and see the commissioner as I say this, because I think so much of this, and I can't, there he is. So much of this is, I think, related to his, his and his team's professionalism. I don't agree that the logic that Senator Dalcola just articulated or framed is necessarily accurate. I, I don't think that for us as legislators to assume that we've done best by the public and, and ensured the safest, most participatory election as possible comes in the form of us voting for an amendment that says that each ED has to have a polling place. I think that I think that what it comes down to is the professional team on the on the ground taking a look at what's happening and structuring the efforts and the resources accordingly. I take the commissioner at his word about with, with, with regard to what the, their intent and their planning is, but I also think that it's extremely important for them to make, be able to make whatever adjustments have to be made and are merited by what ends up happening the next two to three months, the next four to five months. Um, I, I think that it could be very problematic to, to, to write into law that each ED has to have a polling location. If that then triggers a situation that the commissioner sort of discussed already about staffing concerns, which in fact could result in polling places that end up being not, not well run in regards to what they have available that day. And so I, I think that it's, it's far better to let the team do the job with no indication over the past of, of any kind of anything untoward happening from Delaware Department of Elections um, and, and, and take it from there and figure it out from there. Uh, they've always been responsive and professional and made sure to do a, a good job based on what's happening. And I do know from living in Christina School District uh, that that referendum with its, its historic turnout uh, presented a challenge they've learned from. I just don't think us voting on an amendment that says, oh, the way to solve this is to make sure every single ED by statute has a polling place means that we've done best by it. I think best by it is for us as a body to send a very strong uh, message and value to the commissioner, which he himself has already said, that we're going to proceed as normal here. Uh, but that then as things unfold on the ground, adjustments can be made accordingly. That I think is the best way to serve the public. It may end up looking exactly like that. It may not. I don't think that we should assume by passing this amendment and codifying that language in law. I don't think the logic follows. Uh, and I thank very much the commissioner again for all the past and I think all the future professionalism at Delaware DOE. Thank you, Madam President. Frank, we have two additional senators. Hands are up uh, in the order in which they were raised. Senator Dalcalo, followed by Senator Sokola. Senator Dalcalo. Thank, thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to clarify that my remark uh, did not go to the professionalism of the staff of the Department of Elections. And, and I'm sure, uh, given uh, Senator Townsend's points, that they acted entirely professionally in the context of the Christine ref referendum. And yet we had uh, what we had there. And, and I'm not casting blame or aspersions, but what happened is a reality that we should not uh, shy away from or ignore. So I, I just wanna make abundantly clear that if there were, for some reason, some type of unforeseen circumstance related to a public health risk that would arise regarding the amendment to this law, as we have seen with respect to the constitutional authority granted by the governor that has been exercised throughout the entire course of this crisis, a uh, public health state of emergency could be articulated and promulgated and a solution uh, developed that would uh, be able to address this. That's happened time and time again with things as uh, pivotal as people's uh, religious beliefs and their creed all the way to uh, more common things like uh, going to the grocery store and shopping. So to think that that uh, we wouldn't be able to come together and develop a process in the face of a legitimate public health crisis if we pass this, that we wouldn't still have that flexibility, I think kind of lays aside the reality of what we experienced for the last 10 or 12 weeks. So I would urge uh, my colleagues again to pass this because I think it does send a clear message that the General Assembly is overwhelmingly militated in favor of uh, public health and public safety uh, and having a safe uh, and open election. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Sokola. Thank you, Madam President. There, there is also another uh, difference between what we're trying to do here and what happened in Christina. And that is, while there was a historic number of voters who voted absentee in the Christina election, they had to go through an assertive process in order to get a ballot uh, to vote 
absentee in the Christina process. And actually I heard concerns about how cumbersome that was. And, and this is something that I believe is far more fair and for, far more appropriate uh, and, and would, would make the, uh, the need for this amendment uh, much less needed. And, and I will vote no on the amendment. Okay, I see no other hands raised. Senator Richardson, your pleasure with your amendment, sir. I'd like to call the election commissioner back. I have a question okay. for him. Commissioner Albanese, personal yes. privilege is granted to you, sir. Okay, it's already in the Delaware Code that there has to be a polling place open for each district. So we're, we're going to change the way that we're doing business. What would be the process? Do you have a process in place for notifying people? Uh, when is the last possible time that you would uh, decide that a polling place could not be open? Uh, would there be enough adequate time for uh, the people, the, uh, the voters to be notified? Well, we make every effort to notify the voters as soon as we're aware of any potential change. Um, certainly, um, ideally, we, we have notice of change as early as possible. Sometimes we don't. Um, just by a very brief example, we had a situation a few years back in Townsend in Newcastle County where there was a roof collapse at the Townsend Fire Hall and that was very last minute. Uh, we were still able to get information out, but um, it was um, it was very much last minute. Um, but you're, you're correct, that is there are provisions in the code for that now. Um, sometimes in, um, usually many, most election districts have a, have a facility that's um, compatible or a building. Some in the smaller uh, districts like um, up in Wilmington, you know, where I myself live in the city of Wilmington, you know, there are very small election districts. Sometimes the, the location may be adjacent to the ED um, uh, and has a, services a couple of election districts. But, um, you know, uh, even in those instances, regardless of size, we try to get, we best basically get a notice out to every um, voter. Usually it's by letter. Um, it used to be postcards. Now it's a letter, so it's a little more noticeable. And certainly updates on websites um, and any uh, information we have available online. Okay. Uh, other than a roof falling down on people, um, we're talking about a, um, a virus. We're talking about something that may uh, be a serious problem. How far out do you think you will be able to when do you think you'll be able to recognize that there is a problem and whether or not you're going to have to shut down some of the polling places? Um, well, we, our offices monitor and they're, they're already, in, in fact, in the process of they've already sent out their recruitment letters for poll workers already uh, for the fall elections and they're receiving those back. Um, certainly, um, they keep close tabs on that, any trends that they see of individuals who may not be uh, wanting to report or deciding not to continue to serve as a poll worker. Um, uh, we asked, you know, basically I asked them to be sure to monitor that very closely and, and make aware if we have any problems as early as possible. Okay. Uh, and we're sending out thousands of letters granted. So it's that many thousands of letters of availability letters that go out. So it's an ongoing process, you know, of them coming back and being, being checked and logged in and availability being noted. So okay. it's kind of a rolling process. Okay, all right, thank you. I believe Senator McDowell, if you have a question for the witness. Yeah. Yes, if, Madam President, thank yes. you, uh, yes. Madam President. Uh, Commissioner, um, my, my concern as I think about it on this, it may not be the only concern with this amendment, but, um, and certainly I, I don't think uh, there's any intention on the sponsors to, part to, to create this, but my concern is that this would resol could resolve and us having, and the commissioner having to move resources from a place where they were not needed to a place where they are, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the other way around, from a place where they are needed to a place where they're not needed or, or they're needed less so. Uh, on election day or sometime before that, I believe the uh, commissioner will only have so many resources at his control to deal with situations as they arise. And uh, so I, I think this, kind of arbitrarily putting in the law a, a figure is maybe not what we should do. And I wonder if the commissioner would like to comment on that. Um, basically, I think um, 
Senator, yeah, but you mentioned to your point, yeah, I think, you know, we're certainly we're always dealing with a lot of a lot of competing you know, demands out there and, and sometimes you know more more limited resources um but um i i do appreciate um you know the flexibility that we have sometimes to to redeploy some items if we need them and um and thankfully i will say as a um a tribute to our poll workers many of whom are long standing long serving although we have many new ones every time um thankfully they are very flexible and they're uh, they're also very professional, so you know sometimes we have to redeploy people we don't like to if we can, especially because some people have preferences to work in certain locations and with certain people, and you know we try to honor that they know the neighborhood they live in the neighborhood, um, you know ideally we try to uh, you know keep keep some um, in their local areas as much as possible though that doesn't happen all the time based on needs, but uh, we we appreciate your you know the trust in us to uh, to do that and carry out those duties. Any other questions of the witness? Seeing none, we'll have our witness excused. Um, I do not see any additional hands raised, Senator Richardson. Your pleasure, sir. Okay, I in a, just a minute I'll ask for a roll call vote, but I I do think that this just it's already in the law. It's already a requirement. We're not asking for anything new. We're just saying that our elections are so important that we want to make sure that everyone has opportunity to vote and that doesn't have to drive way out of their way in order to vote. Um, I just think it's, it, it, it opens the door to allow for a, a situation that we, we shouldn't be allowing, you know, it, there should be a place in each election district for people to vote. Uh, I just, I just feel like it's already in the, in the law not asking for anything special. Uh, they are, the circumstances that we're under can be um, um, looked at ahead of time so that we're preparing for the proper, uh, uh, so that we can properly handle any emergencies that occur as far as the virus is concerned. Um, I just, I just feel like anything less than this is not doing, uh, fulfilling our responsibilities to hold elections that are open to, uh, to everyone in each election district roll call. Madam Secretary, would you kindly call roll on Senate Amendment 2 to House Bill 346? Senator Panini. Yes. Yes. Senator Brown. No. No. Senator Cloutier. No. No. Senator Del Polo. Yes. Yes. Senator Ennis. No. No. Senator Hansen. No. No. Senator Hawker. Yes. Yes. Senator Lawson. Yes. Yes. Senator Lockman. No. No. Senator Lopez. Yes. Yes. Senator McBride. No. No. Senator McDowell. No. No. Senator Pardee. No. No. Senator Pettyjohn. Yes. Yes. Senator Poor. No. No. Senator Richardson. Yes. Yes. Senator Sokola. No. No. Senator Sturgeon. No. No. Senator Townsend. No. No. Senator Walsh. No. No. Senator Wilson. Yes. Yes. Madam President, roll call on Senate Amendment 2 to House Bill 346, 8 yes, 13 no. Having failed to receive the required sufficient number of votes, Senate Amendment 2 declared failed in the Senate to House Bill 346. Senator Porter? Um, you know what? I'm jumping ahead to a roll call. I must be uh, jumping ahead of our ballots. We need to continue with our amendment. Senator Bonini has been patiently waiting. Oh my goodness. Senator Bonini, sorry to you. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And before I ask for Senate Amendment 3, you know, I'm always trying to get my colleagues to vote no, but, you know, I didn't think they'd be so enthusiastic, <laughs> I, you know. Uh, but uh, 
Uh, if I could kindly have uh, Senate Amendment Number Three brought, and, and Madam President, it's a pretty short amendment, so, uh, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So, if it's all right, I would like to ask for that amendment to be read in full. And, and Madam President, I don't sort of want to slow things up. If you think it's too lengthy an amendment to read in full, I'd be happy to defer to your judgment. But I, I think it would be helpful if it was read in full because I think it's sort of self-explanatory. Well, if it's going to cut down on dialogue, um, we will have that right in. I can't promise um, that. <laughs> okay. Um, Mr. Assistant Secretary, if you would kindly read in, uh, in full Senate Amendment Number 3 to House Bill 346. Senate Amendment Number 3 to House Bill Number 346, sponsored by Senator Benini. Amend House Bill Number 346 on line 133 after election by inserting the following. If an individual delivers a ballot envelope, the individual must provide proof of identity and sign a record maintained by the Department of all ballot envelopes delivered under this paragraph A for B of this section. Further amend House Bill number 346 by deleting lines 134 through 135 in their entirety and inserting in lieu thereof the following. Five, an individual may not deliver to the department under paragraph A for B of this section more than three ballot envelopes during the same election. Madam President, this concludes the reading of Senate Amendment number three to House Bill number 346 in full. Senator Bonini, Senate Amendment number three to House Bill 346 before the Senate, sir. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to the Assistant uh, Secretary for reading that in, in full. So uh, let me just, if I could just so, sort of state to start with, first of all, I apologize, I don't have visual, but but just to state to, to start with, uh, I believe, and I quite frankly know that all of my colleagues believe that access to mail-in voting in these trying times is absolutely critical. And I don't think, uh, and and I support that. And I quite frankly think everyone, in, everyone on, on this call uh, supports that. Um, we have, as Senator McBride said, uh, you know, trying and unique circumstances this year. I thought he was very articulate on that. Um, but with the changes comes uh, po potential consequences that we that we probably would not have had uh, without the idea of mailing everybody a ballot, uh, including, you know, seven percent that that don't have valid addresses. So the reality is that with uh, this bill, we are going to be uh, opening the potential for fraud. It's just that simple. Um, and you know, I'm sure my colleagues are going to say that's not the case, but I think you know anybody who has sort of an understanding uh, reads the bill and, and realizes that that these ballots are going out to everybody. And I understand it's a two-step process, but but uh, we have evidence uh, throughout the country. It's you know it's. it's, it's of fraud, uh, specifically called vote harvesting. Uh, I am a little ashamed to admit that I think there was actually a Republican consultant uh, prosecuted for uh, for vote harvesting, and, uh, and also a variety of Democrat consultants uh, throughout the country. In some states, it is legal. Um, I don't think I'd be very surprised if any of my colleagues thought that vote harvesting, which is, uh, uh, as you know, a way of of combining sort of invalid votes and taking votes that are valid and destroying them before turning them in, et cetera. I, I would doubt any uh, of my colleagues would like that to be the everyday uh, occurrence in our elections. Some states do allow it. Um, but the reality is that I think we can fix the, uh, prevent that reasonably easily by, by inserting the, the couple lines that, uh, that this amendment represents. Um, a heavily Democrat state just north of us, New Jersey, has this exact language. So this is not a partisan issue. Uh, I think you know we're concerned about the potential for for voter fraud, and this is a, uh, I think, a reasonably easy. Um, and I have absolute faith that the that the commissioner uh, could could accomplish this, uh, and his team could accomplish this. Uh, I think this is a reasonably easy safeguard. Uh, that would that would uh, I, I think prevent the potential of uh, of fraud, and I know, and I don't know if I can speak for any of my colleagues, but but if this if this what I think is very simple language, and I think quite frankly helpful language, because I don't think any of us want that voter fraud. Uh, if this were added, I I you know I think I'd be much more 
would, would like to support this bill. So um, this is simply a, a, a chance to, to prevent uh, fraud uh, and prevent uh, boat harvesting and some of the other, other things by, by simply you know, saying that you can't, people can't bundle ballots and return them in, which of course is, is uh, what hap what's happened unfortunately in, in some elections throughout the country. So uh, thank you, Madam President. And uh, um, I certainly hope we adapt, uh, adopt this amendment. Okay. I don't see any hands raised at this time. So um, Senator, your action, sir. So, so Madam President, I think I'm gonna ask for a roll call and I do hope that my colleagues will, will support this. And I, and I realize that, you know, that, that, that sometimes we have partisan ideas and they're straight partisan roll calls or, or close to it. And, and, you know, and I, and I realize that this is may be one of those bills. And I, I think it would be really unfortunate if that were the case, because I do believe that all three of our uh, Republican amendments were not, uh, and I certainly can speak for mine, were not brought in any uh, obstructionist way. They were in fact, you know, uh, and again, I, I know specifically for mine, and I, quite frankly, I think all three of our amendments have been brought in the spirit of we think we agree with the with the basis here, but we think there are some tweaks that could make it better. Um, so you know, I regrettably think I will be able to predict this roll call, Madam President. Uh, but I hope that's not the case. I, I think this is a, a reasonably easy safeguard. So you are asking for roll call. Uh, Madam President, I apologize. I think this is a reasonably easy safeguard, and I hope my colleagues will uh, support it. And I would kindly ask for a roll call. Thank okay. you. Thank you. You're welcome, um, Madam Secretary. Would you kindly call roll on Senate Amendment Three to House Bill Three Forty Six? Senator Bernini. Yes. Yes. Senator Brown. No. No. Senator Couture. No. No. Senator Del Hollow. Yes. Yes. Senator Ennis. No. No. Senator Hansen. No. No. Senator Hawker. Yes. Yes. Senator Lawson. Yes. Yes. Senator Lockman. No. No. Senator Lopez. Yes. Yes. Senator McBride. No. No. Senator McDowell? No. No. Senator Pardee? No. No. Senator Pettyjohn? Yes. Yes. Senator Poor? No. No. Senator Richardson? Yes. Yes. Senator Sokola? No. No. Senator Sturgeon? No. No. Senator Townsend? No. No. Senator Walsh? No. No. Senator Wilson? Yes. Yes. Madam President, the roll call on Senate Amendment 3 to House Bill 346, 8 yes, 13 no. I have an issue there with my, can you hear me now? Having failed to receive the required and sufficient number of Vote Senate Amendment Number Three, defeated in the Senate as attachment to House Bill Three Forty Six. Senator McBride, we are now to use her on the bill. Madam President, uh, at this time, are there any members that have uh, questions and/or comments concerning the legislation before us? If not, Madam there President, there are questions. Uh, you have two hand, three hands are raised. Okay. Um, in this order, we have Senator. Uh, Del Calo, Senator Benini, perhaps it was Senator Benini, um, and Senator Walsh. So we'll start with Senator Del Calo. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I, I find the, the most recent roll call to be very uh, unique uh, in one particular way, which is because uh, we just voted down a rule that's in, that actually comes from New Jersey uh, and is an active rule in a uh, pretty blue state there and uh, that this may be the first time in a long time that we see an idea from New Jersey that doesn't get taken up in Delaware. So I want us all to remember this. Um, but that you know, sort of like tongue-in-cheek uh, remark aside, 
Um, I do want to emphasize to those listening at home that uh, although I think the bill we have in front of us has some flaws uh, in that it uh, leaves quiet uh, concern that should be coming from the General Assembly with respect to avoiding crowding at polling places, uh, in that it uh, sidesteps, I think, an important issue regarding accuracy, uh, because we could very easily send out robust communications about a, a mail-in voting process and very easily have expanded the manner in which folks request mail-in ballots uh, in order to permit uh, a, a process where we're not inadvertently sending the wrong applications to the wrong people, which will inevitably happen. And I truly hope that that does not cause anyone who wishes to exercise a fundamental civil right from having their vote disenfranchised. I'll certainly share uh, with all of you if I hear that happening in the seventh, because I think it's something that we should remember if it occurs. Uh, and, and although uh, the bill uh, could have uh, addressed the issue of the uh, rule from New Jersey and the fact that there were some untoward behaviors in other states that we could have avoided here, I nonetheless believe that the overarching goal here uh, which is to make sure that we honor uh, a fundamental civil right by not requiring people to balance that against another fundamental civil right, which is to uh, be alive <laughs> and to not have that uh, interfered with too early or unduly, that we, uh, we have to recognize that careful balance. So although I believe this measure could have improved, been improved and should have been improved, I will nonetheless uh, be voting in favor because uh, I, I support uh, fundamental civil rights of all stripes and certainly not uh, based upon uh, the convenience of a certain geopolitical viewpoint. Because if they're in the Constitution, then they ought to be supported. And uh, Madam President, I appreciate your uh, recognizing me to provide remarks. Senator Walsh. And you'll need to unmute yourself, sir. Thank you, Madam President. Um, as the prime Senate sponsor of the original vote by mail bill, uh, HB 175, and along with Representative Brady, this bill was origin originally about voter convenience, voter satisfaction, citizens being able to stay at home, take all the, the time they need to study the issues, and to increase voter, voter turnout. And along with that, this was also a job creation bill with the United, United Postal Workers Union at the time. So this, this has morphed into more than that right now as a public safety bill. Um, with that said, I would like to, uh, to reiterate that this bill, what better way to have a trial for HB 175 to actually activate this bill now that I support. And our bill, HB 175, promulgated the Department of, of Elections to basically come up with the rules for, for the vote by mail. Bill, which they did, and I'm confident that we have the rules in place to make this effective and safe and keep our public uh, safe from the COVID-19 at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Benini's hand had raised. Senator yeah. Benini. Th thank you, Madam President. Um, I will not be supporting this bill, and, and I wanted to, um, uh, and I think uh, I think we have a great process in place now where people can, can ask for absentee ballots, by the way, and I would have certainly supported extending that. Um, but I mean, I think the reality is that we are inviting fraud. I don't think, I, I'm not going to accuse anybody of, of doing that deliberately, but we are inviting fraud. Uh, it is going to happen. Uh, we are going to have vote harvesting in Delaware, period. Um, I, uh, it's going to happen. And I'll be honest with you, there are some colleagues across the way who will be the victims of that. Uh, quite frankly, before some of us on our side will be victims of that. Uh, you know, I, I, I be, be very, very careful what you wish for. Um, and, uh, and I think, uh, you know, there are uh, organizations throughout this country that have made vote harvesting an art. Uh, they have targeted more moderate Democrats as their first targets. They eventually move on to Republicans. Um, I hope I'm wrong, Madam President, 
and as Senator Townsend will surely agree with, I'm frequently wrong, <laughs> but, I, uh, but I don't think I am. Uh, and we are, we are, I think, unfortunately, uh, we're inviting fraud. And, uh, and please, I would say, be, be very, very careful what you wish for. And, uh, and I will not be supporting a bill. Madam President, thank you very much. Senator McBride, to you, sir. I don't see any other hands raised. Madam President, I thank you very much. Uh, and I would like at this time to please ask for a roll call on the legislation. Madam Secretary, would you kindly call roll on House Bill 346 as amended with House amendments? Senator Benini. No. No. Senator Brown. Yes. Yes. Senator Coutier. Yes. Yes. Senator Del Colo. Yes. Yes. Senator Ennis. Yes. Yes. Senator Hansen. Yes. Yes. Senator Hawker. No. No. Senator Lawson. Yes. Yes. Senator Lockman. Yes. Yes. Senator Lopez. Yes. Yes. Senator McBride. Yes. Yes. Senator McDowell. Yes. Yes. Senator Pardee. Yes. Yes. Senator Pettyjohn. Yes. Yes. Senator Poor. Yes. Yes. Senator Richardson. Yes. Yes. Senator Sicola. Yes. Yes. Senator Sturgeon. Yes. Yes. Senator Townsend. Yes. Yes. Senator Walsh. Yes. Yes. Senator Wilson. No. No. Madam President, roll call on House Bill 346 as amended by House Amendment 5, 18 yes, 3. Having received the required sufficient number of votes, House Bill 346 declared passed the Senate. Senator Poor. Thank you, Madam President. At this time, I'm going to yield to Senator Lachman for House Bill 350. Senator Lachman. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'd like to ask that House Bill 350 be read into the record by title only and brought before the Senate for consideration. Okay, and this was also under suspension of the rules. Correct, yes. All right, so we are going to ask our, our Assistant Secretary, Kindly Spur, to read in House Bill 350 by title only. House Bill 350, sponsored by Representative Chikwocha, Representative Bolden, Representative Cook, Representative Dorsey Walker, Representative Kay Johnson, Representative Minor Brown, Senator Lockman, Senator Brown, and others. An act to amend Title 11 of the Delaware Code relating to chokeholds. Madam President, this concludes the reading of House Bill number 350 by title only. Senator Lockman, House Bill 350 is before the Senate. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I hope that it goes without saying, although I'm, I'm going to, that the issue of law enforcement using various forms of chokeholds has drawn national outra outrage recently. After George Floyd had his neck knelt on by an officer for nearly nine minutes while in custody, killing him. Um, I can't breathe is a refrain that has sadly been so common in custody, uh, common in custody as to become a refrain for the national movement for black lives and it's, it's past time to end this. I'm glad to say that we've heard consistently from our local law enforcement that this technique is not taught in any law enforcement training program and police departments do not include the use of choke holds or knee holds in their use of force policies. Uh, and while of course we take them at their word, it is important to show with our code that this is not simply discouraged, but actively disallowed, and that we are going to hold accountable those that would violate that standard. The House has just unanimously shown their commitment to do so, and this is now our opportunity as the Senate to pass this key piece of the Delaware Legislative Black Caucus's Justice for All agenda today. House Bill 350 explicitly prohibits law enforcement officers from using chokeholds knee holds or other techniques that can cause injury or death from a lack of blood or oxygen flow. Uh, it creates the crime of aggravated strangulation. 
Under this bill, a law enforcement officer acting in their official capacity is prohibited from knowingly using a technique intended to restrict a person's airway or prevent their breathing or intended to constrict the flow of blood by applying pressure or force to the carotid artery, the jugular vein, or the side of the neck of another person. Uh, this would be a class D felony unless the officer using a chokehold causes serious physical injury or death, thereby elevating the crime to a class C felony. Um, so of course I would love to go to, to roll call, but I, I believe there may be um, an amendment proposal or maybe some comments. And there is an amendment. Um, I believe I'm trying to locate Senator Pettyjohn. I'm here. There you are. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> you moved around on the board. Okay, Senator Pettyjohn. <laughs> Madam President, uh, may I have Senate Amendment 1 to House Bill 350 read in, please? Mr. Assistant Secretary, would you kindly read in Senate Amendment 1 to House Bill number 350? Senate Amendment number one to House Bill number 350, sponsored by Senator Petty John. Madam President, this concludes the reading of Senate Amendment one to House Bill number 350. Senate Amendment one to House Bill 350 before the Senate, Senator Petty John. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And uh, I wanna thank the sponsor of this bill. Um, you know, one of the things that we're always looking at is, is constant improvement in everything that we do. Um, when this happened, one of my first calls was to a local police chief, and, and I and I asked, "Are chokeholds taught in the academy?" And, and he looked at me, and it wasn't even a tenth of a second. He said, "Nope, absolutely not." Uh, so I said, "Well, what do you think of of this bill?" And, and he read the bill, and he said, "Brian, knowingly is a problem." And and I asked why. He said, "Well." You know, when you are in a situation where you are where where you are struggling with a uh, a suspect, and the 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 minute your arm goes around that neck, and you know it, well, that's knowingly. And I said, well, you know, there there's a there's something in there that says if if uh, deadly force is necessary, he said deadly force isn't always necessary in hand to hand. So we started having discussions about that and uh, we came up with this amendment that just strikes knowingly. So the bill would read the person intentionally uses a chokehold on another person. And that's the key difference. If you're struggling and you go around the neck, you know it, you know you're there. Did you intend to do that? If you intended to do it, that could be a problem. If you knowingly did it, that's where the officer would have to make a decision at that point in time, whether he's going to back off and possibly put himself in danger or other people in danger. And that high of a bar, I think, is unnecessary for our law enforcement. I want to support the bill. I will absolutely support the bill. I think, you know, using the chokehold in, in, in a way that is, that, that is irresponsible is, is something that our law enforcement shouldn't do. But to put them in this predicament where they could, you know, unintentionally be committing a felony just by trying to get a suspect under control, I think is, is, a, is a line that we don't want to cross. Um, I, I see some of my colleagues have uh, raised their hands and, and may want to offer additional comments to this. Yes, we have hands raised, Senator Lawson and Senator Lockman. So Senator Lawson and Senator Lockman. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate the opportunity to weigh in on this. After 27 years in law enforcement and having to tussle with many, many folks and in face and in fact use lethal force in encounters, uh, this bill is unnecessary. We don't have the problem in Delaware. This happened in Minneapolis. We don't have that aggressive uh, community that they have out there. We don't have police officers being brutal here. If they are, if they show, the, show those signs, what happens is the council and police training decertifies them. Whether they're found guilty or not, their certification can be uh, taken away so they cannot be a police officer. So we as a population in Delaware, per capita at least, decertify more police officers for wrongdoing per capita. Now that's across the board. That could be 
disseminating information that's sensitive or it could be wrecking a police car. But nonetheless, we police our own, but we do it more than any other state per capita. I think this bill doesn't address a problem, it manufactures a problem. And I think that the, the taking knowingly out of there doesn't damn our police officers, but yet it still protects the public quite well. So thank you. Senator Lockman. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I appreciate the, that input. Um, I just wanted to point out a, a couple of items about the bill. Um, the bill's primary sponsor, Representative Chukocha and myself do view the, the amendment as a weakening one and unfriendly to the ultimate goal of legislation. Um, wanted to point out that there is a provision within the bill that uh, acknowledges the potential uh, use of, of force in a life-threatening situation. Um, and then also, I think to, to highlight also that um, the reason the word knowingly is contained in the bill um, is due to consistency across the code for strangulation and, and just carrying that over into uh, aggravated strangulation as well. And that is a consistent standard without which um, we'd be deviating from the norm. And I, if I may request personal privilege of the floor, would be happy to invite uh, our Senate uh, attorney, Frank Murphy, up to describe that in more legal terms. Sure, your personal privilege is granted. Thank you. And I noticed Senator Hawker's hand has gone up, sir. I don't know if you'll have questions later of the witness. If not, I will get to you, sir. I saw you. So to uh, Mr. Murphy, if you're with us. Perhaps Mr. Murphy needs to there be unmuted. Is. There I'm, he is. I'm unmuted. I'm unmuted. Um, Mr. Murphy, I thought perhaps you could just speak to to the the reasoning behind keeping knowingly and intentionally in that that particular code. Well, I, I wanted to say first of all that I, I understand that the, uh, the Department of Justice has reviewed this bill and uh, did not offer any comments with respect to eliminating the knowingly element, uh, as Senator. Uh, Lockman indicated, uh, there's another provision in the code on strangulation, and that uses the, the same terms knowingly or intentionally. Uh, I think it might give some comfort to the sponsor of the amendment. Uh, uh, if we look at <clears throat> the definition of chokehold, uh, it means any of the following. And if we look at lines six and seven, eight and nine, uh, although the officer could act knowingly, which is a lesser standard than intentionally in terms of appreciating the, the, the chokehold, uh, the bill does on those lines require that there be an intent to restrict the person's airway, uh, to prevent the breathing uh, of, the, of the person being subdued, uh, and an intent to restrict uh, the flow of blood. So while appreciating the fact that in a struggle, a police officer, a law enforcement officer may have to uh, do something involving the person's neck or the area of the carotid artery. Uh, it does require, or in addition to the knowingly element, an intent to uh, do those items that I uh, that I pointed out that are that are part of the elements of the bill. So, so the. The knowingly aspect of it is mitigated. I, I would suggest you legally to a significant degree uh, by placing the intent not on the act of the chokehold, but on the intent to either restrict the blood flow or prevent the person from breathing. So looking at that, I, I would hope that, uh, or well, it somewhat mitigates the notion that an officer is going to find himself or herself in trouble uh, by employing a lesser standard when 
uh, the chokehold definition requires an intent to cause this type of serious consequence. So that's what I, that's my answer. For our witness, um, Senator Hocker, did you have a question? If not, I have Senator Del Calo whose hand has gone up. Senator Hocker, did you have a question? Not for the witness. the witness. Senator Del Calo of the witness, sir. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, hello, Mr. Murphy, how are you? Uh, pretty good. Good, uh, it's good to see you. It's been a bit, a bit of a while since we've had the occasion to ask you some questions. So um, I do appreciate you being here and available to, to discuss this measure. So I, it occurred to me, and it occurred to me late, unfortunately, in the game, um, because I too had been in discussions for quite some time regarding the issue of knowingly, and Senator Lockman knows, you know, I've probably had, she's probably getting tired of seeing my cell phone number on her, on her mobile device, calling her about this measure, trying to uh, address concerns and make sure we're proceeding in a, uh, in a manner that embraces the best course forward for Delaware. Um, but it, it occurred to me, uh, sort of like mid-morning today, after looking at everything again, if we're talking about statutory consistency uh, and making sure that this standard is consistent with the strangulation language in the other part of the code, then I agree that that uh, jives with that overall goal of statutory consistency. But isn't there another portion of the bill, given that we're talking about consistency and a concern for it, that is different than the language we use. And that is with respect to the manner in which you're having to have the burden of production met to use the affirmative defense. I see the word reasonably in the use of the affirmative defense, and I don't see the word reasonably in the use of the affirmative defense in the rest of our code for a general use of deadly force. So just on the issue of consistency, because I don't wanna to get too far afield on that other issue, which I think we can discuss when we're talking about the bill generally. But on the general issue of consistency, making sure that this, this doesn't cause an inconsistency in one way, my concern lies with whether or not that is consistent. So I wanted to make sure that I was reading that properly. I, I believe that the reasonably element would be read into the section 607 in any event. I, I know it doesn't say that expressly, it says, it is an affirmative defense that an act constituting strangulation was the result of a legitimate medical procedure. I see that. I mean, uh, I mean, with respect to the general affirmative defense that we have when there's deadly force. So as, as I'm sure you're aware, if a person's confronted with deadly force in Delaware, there's a general duty to retreat unless it's safe for them to do so. And then uh, they're allowed to use deadly force if they believe that there is uh, imminent risk of death, severe bodily injury, of course, of sexual intercourse. And so that, that has been that belief, not reasonable belief, but belief has been the standard in Delaware probably for 50 or 60 years. And so I was wondering if there's a consistency concern in that respect that I, I missed, frankly, because I, I tried to look at this and vet it, but I admit that with the compressed schedule, I may have missed it. I'm, I'm not concerned about that as an inconsistency. I, I have to confess to you. Uh, I don't have the jury instructions for the defense in front of me. Uh, my thinking is, and my general understanding would be that there would have to be a reasonableness element to it for you to assert the defense, so. Well, I will. I will. Well, I, 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 don't, I, I don't necessarily agree that there's. Yeah, a, I don't want to get too far afield of the amendment which we're discussing. So I'll probably call you back when we're talking about the general bill. But thank you. Yeah. Is there any other questions of our witness? If not, uh, Senator Lockman, your pleasure with our witness. <laughs> oh, request that the witness be dismissed. Thank you. Yes. Don't go far. Uh, Frank, as you heard, uh, you may be questioned soon. Senator Hawker of the- um, Not on the witness at this time and not on the amendment also, I withdraw. Okay, so you will wanna wait for the bill. Yes. Okay, so we will go back to Senator Pettyjohn. Uh, thank you, Madam President. If there are no further questions, I'll ask for a roll call. Yes. Madam Secretary, would you kindly call a roll on Senate Amendment 1 to House Bill 350? Senator Panini. Yes. Yes. Senator Brown. 
No. No. Senator Cloutier. No. No. Senator Del Polo. No. No. Senator Ennis. No. No. Senator Hansen. No. No. Senator Hawker. Yes. Yes. Senator Lawson. Yes. Yes. Senator Lockman. No. No. Senator Lopez. No. No. Senator McBride. No. No. Senator McDowell. No. No. Senator Pettyjohn. Yes. Yes. Senator Pardee. No. No. Senator Poor. Here. No. Senator Richardson. Yes. Yes. Senator Sokola. No. No. Senator Sturgeon. No. No. Senator Townsend. No. No. Senator Walsh. No. No. Senator Wilson. Yes. Yes. Madam President, the roll call on Senate Amendment 1 to House Bill 350. Excuse me. Six yes, 15 no. Having failed to receive the required and sufficient number of votes, Senate Amendment 1 to House Bill 350 declared defeated in the Senate. Senator Lockman to the bill now, and I do believe there have been questions earlier. Senator okay. Del Callo's hand is up. Senator Del Callo, sir. Yeah, thank bill. you. Thank you, Madam President. And this is a, a question more generally about the bill. I didn't want to get too far afield uh, on the bill while we were on the amendment. So, Mr. Mr. Murphy, are you still there? I'd like to, to ask for privilege of the floor for Mr. Yes. Murphy. Privilege of the floor for Mr. Murphy. And in the meantime, I want to acknowledge Senator Lawson. I see your hand, sir. So we will get to you. Senate, uh, the Senator has called for our personal privilege of Frank Murphy, whom I now see. Mr. <laughs> Murphy, to you, well, Senator Del Callo. Thank you, Madam President. Welcome back again, Mr. Murphy. Um, so just to make sure that I'm understanding the wording of the affirmative defense properly, wherein a person would be able to use uh, a, a chokehold as defined in the face of deadly force. Could you just uh, read that for us? Because I, I have another section of the code open. It's hard for me to have both at the same time. Uh, you're talking about lines 15 to 17? I, I believe so, yes. Notwithstanding sections 462 through 468 of this title to the contrary, the use of a chokehold is only justifiable when the person reasonably believes that the use of deadly force is necessary to protect the life of a civilian or a law enforcement officer. Th thank you, Mr. Murphy. So here is the question that I was getting to before that was probably slightly outside of the scope of uh, the subject matter, which is this. Under uh, 11 Delaware Code Section 464, specifically subsections A, B, and C, there's language there. And that language says the use of force upon, and, and, and by the way, the general code section's title is use of force in self-protection. So the general code section's title is that, and if you go to 464A, it says, the use of force upon or towards another person is justifiable when the defendant believes that such force is immediately necessary for the purpose of protecting the defendant against the use of unlawful force by the other person on the present occasion. B, subsection B says, uh, except uh, as otherwise provided in subsections D and E of this section, the person employing protective force may estimate the necessary uh, thereof under the circumstances as the person believes them to be when the force is used without retreating, surrendering possession, uh, doing any other act which the person has no legal duty to do or abstaining from any lawful action. And then C says, the use of deadly force is justifiable under this section if the defendant believes that such force is necessary to protect the defendant against death, serious physical injury, kidnapping, or sexual intercourse compelled by force or threat. So really my question goes to the word believes in 464A and 464C. 
understanding, as I unfortunately do, the penchant of our exacting judiciary to say that words included in one section certainly mean something, and to say that we don't ever intend the language used in amendments to the law to be mere surplusage, it seems to me that a court would probably interpret the word reasonably believes, as in reasonably, to mean something, because that word is not in sections 464A and 464C, that the only word that's, that's there is believes. If the defendant believes, if the defendant believes. So my question is, does this, um, does this mean that there's a slightly different interpretation or a slightly different burden of production for using the affirmative defense in the law that we're discussing as compared to what it is in section 464 regarding the general justification for use of force and self-protection? Uh, res respectfully, I, I don't really think there is a difference. I'm struggling with trying to figure out whether there's a material difference of any kind. So uh, you're looking at 464 and it says defendant believes. And of course, if you're a criminal defendant, uh, you're going to argue uh, that you believe something. Uh, what the prosecution will argue to the contrary is, was your belief reasonable? So again, I, I don't have a jury instruction for this defense available to me right now. I am looking at the provision of the code that you cited, but it's going to be the same battle uh, as to intent, I think, regardless of whether the word reasonable is in there or not. And I, I don't think it I don't think it makes the prosecution of the offense, the chokehold offense, materially different uh, in any way. I, I'm not sure what the court would do with the jury instruction because if you're the judge, you're looking at the statute and you're looking at 464 and I don't know whether the judge would put the word reasonable in the jury instruction or not. I, it seemed to me it's either way that's going to be the argument. Was the belief a reasonable belief? So I'm, the word reasonable is not in there uh, in 464. I, B and, uh, A and C, and I agree with that. Uh, A, B, and C, it's not there. It's in the statute. I'm just I just don't think it makes the burden on the prosecution any less or the job of the defense lawyer really any different, uh, from my perspective. So. I, 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 th thank you for answering that. So I guess my only thought is, being that there was a concern about consistency within the statute and consistency within the code for the amendment, is it just that that principle of consistency is is lesser here because of the specific circumstance, or uh, are we really confident? I mean, I, I have heard that in some jurisdictions, and I'd have to really, really look up the case law on this. I didn't have the time to this morning, but I had heard in some jurisdictions that um, including the word reasonably actually does have a material effect because on the one hand, you can have uh, a situation where the where the standard is subjective and another situation where the standard is objective and vice versa. So ultimately, my primary concern with this is that I would not want to create a wrinkle in the law, which would kind of be self-defeating for the intent of this, which I actually agree with. I intend on supporting this measure. But my concern would be is I don't want to create a situation where the affirmative defense to strangulation is harder to allege than the affirmative defense for the use of a normal amount of deadly force like with a with an officer's sidearm or something like that such that we're we're sending the message that we'd rather have the use of a sidearm than the use of of the chokehold and that would be certainly a very uh, uh, unfortunate result so that's part of the reason why I'm so hung up on this and the issue of consistency well I I'm not citing the issue of consistency as like the be all and end all. I did note that there's consistency with the strangulation statute. I, I understand that. The phrase knowingly or intentionally appears in various sections of the code. Uh, it does not always appear. 
the, with the two combined, sometimes it requires an intent. And as I explained before, uh, and I understand the amendment did not pass, and I, you know, whether an amendment passes or not is not part of my business, but uh, uh, I, I am hopeful that the that those concerned about that aspect of it find some uh, comfort in the fact that uh, there is intention with res required with respect to re the actual uh, infliction of the te technique and what it's going to do to the person. So uh, I can't respond much further other than what I've said before. I understand you have concerns about the objective versus subjective. I, I don't really know that it would be material in the trial of the offense. So. Okay, and, and so so thank that's, you. Man. That's the best I can do, I'm sorry. Right, so, and, and thank you for entertaining my questions, which I understand are a bit in the weeds of this, but I think nonetheless important. So my final question- I have allowed you to go into the legal law court mode, but right. I know it's important. So Very yes, cool. Senator Del Carlo. The law and the criminal code. Mode. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but the final question, I thank you, Madam President, for indulging me. So the final question is, um, with, the, with the term reasonably uh, being in this part of the code and, and that being not here, are there other parts of the code where the term reasonably appears as a modifier and courts have interpreted that to mean something special in those circumstances? Well, there certainly are other provisions in the uh, criminal code that use the word uh, reasonable or reasonably. And I assume that courts give that some type of interpretation, meaning the plain meaning of the word reasonable. Okay. I appreciate that. I have nothing further for the witness. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have had waiting uh, patiently, Senator Lawson and Senator Benini. Senator Lawson. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Frank, I've got a question. Are you familiar with the Coleman case of 1974? No, I'm not, Senator. All right, if I may. Uh, my understanding of that case is prior to that, Delaware used a term reasonable and prudent. That was removed in the Coleman case to believe, or to, to believe the belief of the defendant. That's the person charged, and, and that's the person using force. So that was taken out. Reasonable was done away with in that case pertaining to deadly force. So I think that this applies to deadly force. And so I believe, again, not schooled like you and some of the other colleagues, but uh, I believe that reasonable is critical here. And it's critical to the point that if it's been removed by a previous case, why is it here? And the case involved substantial force. So I think that maybe a little research on that might come up and give us some guidance here because it does have an influence on what we're talking about. When the court saw fit to remove reasonable and prudent for that matter from the statutes, um, we should be following suit on that. That's a court that, that carries quite a bit of weight. Uh, in the Coleman case, it was decided that it was in the mind, in the belief of the beholder, the one that was being assaulted or defending in this case, that they could go ahead and, and use what was for, what force was necessary be, on the basis of what they believed, not what someone decided later was reasonable or not, but what was in the mind of the beholder. Uh, so if if you have any response to that, I would appreciate hearing it. Yeah, I, I wish I could uh, comment on the Coleman case. It, it's just not possible for me to pull it up this quickly and, and study it. I, I did want to say that this does fit in with the, the comment I made before. Uh, I don't want to be unduly repetitive. Uh, when, when we're talking about whether the officer was acting with a reasonable belief. Uh, and we're talking about the use of, of deadly force. And we all can see these techniques are very dangerous uh, to the individual to whom they are applied. But it, it does 
require the intent to show that you intended to cut off the person's airway or you intended to cut off their blood supply. And uh, so I, it, it's kind of a counterbalancing thing, I, I guess I should say. I, I'm not trying to say the word reasonable doesn't mean anything. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling with the fact as to uh, that you're still going to argue that it was your belief and your belief was reasonable at, at the time based on the facts. And the prosecution's going to argue that you may say that's your belief, but looking at the facts, uh, should we really accept that uh, testament? All right, we won't, well, we won't I, cause you to squirm anymore. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, squirm is a good word. <laughs> yes. Okay, Senator Bonini. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Counselor, uh, welcome, and uh, and thank you for, for for all you're doing. And I then I apologize because you did talk about it in the amendment. And Madam President, if I could have just a little leeway because I didn't really understand. Could you explain again? Um, because you know, all of us. Uh, I know I am very concerned about. We don't. We 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 certainly want to protect people, and we certainly don't want people who are intentionally choking uh, folks. I, I think I think we agree with that, but. But also want to are concerned about the protection of the police officers who are who are, who are doing their duty. Could you explain that again? The knowingly that you think that the intent language, and I apologize, I didn't really understand that intersection. So best you can, best best you can, Counselor. <laughs> I I understand, Senator Benini, and I I I want to try to answer it as clearly as possible. So the, the knowingly part comes in on line thirteen. So did you knowingly use a chokehold, which is less of a standard than intentional? Okay, so yes, that it's it's a less high of a hurdle to obtain a successful prosecution. So that part is there is a lesser standard, but you have to also show that it that it was a chokehold. And in order to show that it was actually a chokehold, you must show intent. To, and the intent is not on the act of doing the chokehold, it's the intent on the result, on the outcome for the individual. So you have to show that not only did a police officer put uh, their arm around the neck of a suspect, uh, but that in doing so, the officer intended to restrict the person's airway and prevent them from breathing or uh, apply pressure to the carotid arty, artery or the jugular vein to cut off the blood supply. So you don't just, it's not enough to show that you put some, an officer, uh, put their, their arm around a suspect's neck. Uh, you know, you have to show that they they were using the kind of force and the amount of time necessary to prevent the person from breathing and or cut off the blood supply. So in the case of a suspect who's, you know, saying for over a period of time, uh, minutes, perhaps, I can't breathe, well, then that would show some intent to cut off the breath or if the person becomes unconscious because of a lack of blood supply to the brain and you continue to maintain the hold on the neck, well, that shows an intent to cut off the blood supply uh, to the brain. So at that part, it, it's not enough to show that somebody had their arm around somebody's neck and it was knowing. And the, you know, in the midst of a struggle, uh, you know, you're trying an officer with a, with a suspect with a knife and you're trying to protect yourself and protect the community and not let this person with a knife stab you or somebody else, you, 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 the, the best move you have is to put your arm around the neck. That's, that's not a, an offense because you have to intend to cut off their airway and not let them breathe and, or cut off the blood supply. So 
there is the intent element there that is necessary, even if you're trying to prove a prosecution based on a no, the knowing part of it. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Counselor, yeah. Thank, yeah. Yeah. thank you very much. That was tremendously helpful, and I really appreciate you, thank you, you. Uh, I, uh, explaining that. It quite frankly helps me see the bill and in, in, you know, in, uh, understand the bill better. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Senator Hawker, you no longer have questions, sir. Really more of a concern than a question. You okay. know, I have called 911 several times. The police always respond, respond in a hurry. Um, I have several troopers, town cops that I have talked to in regards to this bill. No one wants to see this bill pass. They are taking such a verbal abuse right now that we could find ourselves in a quite predicament and a shortage of policemen. Let me tell you why. Right now, we got 700 troopers, several town cops, and several county uh, policemen and Wilmington police. I haven't talked to any county or any Wilmington, but I can tell you I've talked to plenty of local policemen and state troopers. Right now, with all this, the last few weeks, with all the shootings, there has been at least 15 go to HR Human Relations and put in for retirement. A trooper told me last night, that there's out of 700 troopers, there's 200 that could go to retirement right here today. And if things get any worse, he said, m many of them will go. We have a class right now in Dover. They wanted to fill that class because there's so shortage in troopers. You know how many is in that class? Two, only one of them from Delaware. That's all they could find that was interested in that class. The other one came from Jersey two state troopers in that class today. The state trooper from, I mean, the one from Delaware was called by his parents and said, with all these shootings going on, he said, if you want to come home, there'll be no questions, we'll accept it. And he chose to stay, but that's only one from Delaware, that's sad. State trooper last night that I talked to says, why are we doing this bill? It's not a problem in Delaware, we don't use this. We don't teach this. Why are we doing it? It's just a slap in the face to those in blue. And there, that's the comment I wanted to make. We are going to be short. I like picking up the phone call 911. They respond to, I've had several break-ins. I've been there. That's a lot easier on me than picking up 38 or nine millimeter. And I want to protect our police. I want to respect our policemen. And I think not having a problem, this is a slap to them and I'll be voting no. We have uh, one other hand that was raised, um, Senator Lawson, and then we'll go to our bill sponsor. Oh wait, Senator Richardson's also waving. So we'll hear from Senator Lawson, Senator Richardson, and then we'll go to our bill sponsor, who I know will be in moving forward, we'll call Senator uh, Lawson. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I know the rule is three times to rise on a bill, but I'm yes, rising and twice on a bill, once on the amendment. Well, we could make that two. <laughs> we'll stick with once the three, on the ahead, sir. Okay. I'm really concerned with this bill and, and Senator Ennis, I think can go along with what I'm about to say. That when you're out there fighting with someone, trying to get them in, into custody and you've got a gun on your hip, you've got mace on your hip or pepper spray today, you've got a nightstick, a baton, you've got your handcuffs, which are absolutely weapons as well. And you're tussling with this guy rolling around on the ground trying to contain him, and you're doing everything you can, you are in fear for your life. There's no doubt about it. You are fighting an end game here. And there is no way that whenever that fight is on, that in my mind, that lethal force is not justified. Because again, it says serious bodily injury, kidnap, rape, or death. When you're fighting with someone, you are facing serious bodily injury, if not death. Particularly if they grab one of the devices you have on your belt or on your body and use it against you. We've seen this recently. So as this goes on, the fight goes on, everybody's getting pretty tired. It's got to be ended. How would you like it to be ended? Would you like to le go to lethal force? and the police officer pull his gun out and shoot the guy? Or would you rather work with 
making it to the point that where the officer can work, but we do not in any way, shape or form tolerate a brutality. This is not anything that anybody wants. And what happened in Minneapolis is inexcusable. There's just no way that that is acceptable. From what we have seen on the video, uh, unless something really bizarre happens, this officer was so far out of line, uh, it, it's an insult to the uniform. But we don't have that problem in Delaware. We haven't had it. And we're gonna chase the tail here and, and try and prevent it when we don't have it. Shouldn't we be passing legislation that, that, that really addresses problems that we have instead of manufacturing a bill to address a problem we don't have? And cops are frustrated right now. They are absolutely frustrated. Our attorney general just dropped charges against 22 people who one of her deputies said to bring for the ride in Camden. You think Senator this Lawson, doesn't affect the to the bill, please? Thank well, you. I am. I am. This is Thank lethal you. force. That's what's going to happen. The frustration is going to lead. We're going to go back, way back to the '60s, where street justice is going to admit, be administered, because cops are not going to put their lives out there for you when you work against them to this point. If you want law enforcement to respond when you call 911. You better have their backs and backs when they're right, not when they're wrong. When they're wrong, absolutely no. I will be the first to go after a bad cop and I have. This is something that's inexcusable and will not be accepted by any of the law enforcement community. And as I said earlier, Delaware does a better job of policing their police than any other state. So why do we wanna jump on a bandwagon to run through here. And that's just what we're doing. You know, I, I can tell you in the years that I spent, my handcuffs were absolutely colorblind. There wasn't anything having to do with, if you did the crime, there was probable cause, then that we went from there. And I think that's 99.9% .9 of the police in Delaware. I just think that this bill is over the top. I don't think it's necessary. I think it's a knee jerk reaction to a catastrophe. And I, I just cannot bring myself to support the bill, not under the circumstances that they are. And I, I, I was a trainer. I trained in, in the academy for over six years. I know what's taught there. And I know chokeholds are not taught. Knee to the neck is not taught. None of these things are taught and are even allowed in the academy. If someone does that in the hand-to-hand -hand combat portion, they're disciplined then and there if not dismissed. So I, I just, I appreciate the effort. I understand it, but I don't think it's a right bill at the right time in the right place. And so I, I, at this point in time, when we can't even get a, a definition of reasonable or, or look at the case that changed from reasonable to belief, and I can tell you, tussling with someone, you have a belief that you're gonna, going to get hurt. Anytime you get in a fight, remember the bad guy has a, has a, a uh, position with the outcome. Definitely a, definitely a determining factor. So. Thank you, Senator. That's where I stand. Oh, that's where I stand on this. And I, I would hope you, some of you at least see see that point and understand it from a practitioner standpoint, not from a 30,000 foot level. I can't um, tell you the number of times I had to defend my life out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Sorry. In this order. I, no, that's fine. Um, didn't mean to be talking. No, we know Thank that uh, come from law enforcement, sir. We respect your service. Um, Senator Richardson, then Senator Pettyjohn, then Senator Del Calo, and then Senator Hansen in that order. So we have Richardson, Pettyjohn, Del Calo, Hansen, unless people change their minds. At this time, Senator Richardson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. What happened to George, George Floyd was wrong. 
the officer is going to be punished. I hope he gets the ultimate punishment for his crime. It was a crime. We do not have that problem in Delaware. We have black officers and we have white officers. I just think that our, our support should be on the, the officer and what we do uh, as a body should support what, what they're doing as long as they're not doing anything illegal. And I know that um, there is a, there's always a, a knee jerk reaction to do something I just think that this law right now at this point in time is unnecessary since it's not a problem in Delaware. Thank you. Next to Senator Pettyjohn. Thank you, Madam President. As many of you know, I served on the Georgetown Town Council uh, and I served as mayor here in Georgetown. When I was on council was when um, Officer Chad Spicer was killed. Uh, what, eight tenths of a mile from where I'm sitting right now. And, you know, I was on my what, first year of town council at that point in time. And, and it changed the way I thought about supporting our police departments, about supporting our law enforcement. Until then, what happened with law enforcement wasn't personal, but that made it very, very personal because somebody under my charge was killed. So I spent a lot of time, probably more time than, you know, most civilians, people that haven't been involved in law enforcement, learning about law enforcement and, and riding with them and talking to our law enforcement officers, seeing what they do every day. And I, I tell you, we have probably the finest trained law enforcement officers in the nation here in Delaware. And I'm going to tell you why. Something called the Council on Police Training. A lot of people that aren't in our business they don't know what the council and police training is, but it is one common accrediting agency here in Delaware that sets the curriculum and manages the discipline of officers within our state. Because we have that one council on police training, that one common curriculum from all of the academies that we have, and we've got well, one, two, three academies here in Delaware, I believe. Um, you have officers that are able to go in situations with other agencies that can pick up and help out at a, at a, at a second's notice. There's no different procedures. There's no different, uh, you know, uh, radio codes. Everybody works off of one common thing. And, and, and I saw that on that night of September when we had law enforcement agencies from across the state flood into Georgetown when Chad was killed. I bring that up because of that common training, that common exemplary training that we have here in Delaware. Chokeholds are not taught in Delaware. They're not. And, and I, don't, I, I know of no officer that would go out there and intentionally put somebody in a chokehold. But at the same time, this bill, if passed, would hamstring our officers, maybe not practically, but in the back of their minds, they would know, you know what, I got to watch out. If I'm trying to get out of a situation, I'm trying to subdue a subject. Well, you know, I, I got to watch what I do. 99.999% of our officers are good officers here in Delaware. I support them. I support them and their families a thousand percent. But I don't want to put us our, ourselves in a situation where we are limiting what they can do to make sure that they come home to their families at the end of their shift. I, I can't support this bill. I, I, I know we shouldn't be doing chokeholds unless it's absolutely necessary. But I think the signal the, that this bill sends is, you know, we're, we're trying to tell you how to do your jobs in law enforcement. And aside from a few of us that are here in this Zoom room, you know, and, and I'm not even including myself here, they've not been on that job. They don't know the ins and outs of what goes on when an officer goes on their shift. I, I have an issue with it. And while I agree with the intent, we don't have a problem with chokeholds in Delaware. 
nobody is going to say that kneeling on the neck of a man for eight minutes is okay. But kneeling on a man on a man's neck for eight minutes is not a chokehold. Thank you, Madam President. Next, if we could hear from Senator Del Callo and then Senator Hansen. Senator Del Callo. Thank you, uh, Madam President. So while we were uh, debating this and discussing this, I tried to look more deeply into the concept of the word reasonableness in this context. And because it's not been there, and this is a new aspect of our law, and because we know what the law has been in Delaware up until this point, I'm just not able to find a very good answer uh, in the short time that we have. I really wish that there had been more time to consider that specific wrinkle because I, I truly don't want to see a scenario where our good intentions here today to call out and condemn what what is behavior that is entirely atrocious and should be uh, subject to the most severe punishment available under Delaware's law if it were to occur, much as it ought to be for any individual who commits intentional murder on another person, on an innocent person. But with that said, I just want my colleagues to think about the fact that the words that we include in statutes mean quite a bit. And that when we include some words that are not there in similar concepts and similar parts of the code, that courts take notice. And I've seen it time and time again in interpreting statutes and arguing that it means one thing and seeing courts come back and say that it means another. It's, it's been a, a common part of my uh, litigation efforts in wrestling over what different statutory pr provisions mean. And to me, I just find it to be highly unlikely that a Delaware court would say that a word like reasonable, which Mr. Murphy confirmed does have meaning throughout our code, does have meaning within the criminal code itself, that having it here and not having it in another place with a very, very similar concept, which is a, a, the affirmative defense when confronted with force or deadly force that is existing in our code. And so my question is, uh, when we do this, because I believe that this will pass, and I think that given the nature of what our society has been confronted with, that Delaware does need to take a strong bipartisan stand against the type of behavior that we need to be targeting here, the type of inhumane, atrocious behavior that we all, I think, are unified in opposing, but that I hope that, that we would examine this post haste, determine what including reasonableness here means, considering the state of the law and other parts of the code, and that if it is not appropriate that a bill be introduced, perhaps even before this session, to remove the word reasonable so that there is a consistent standard across the board. Because I, I understand the idea that we want to have a consistent standard as to the intent of this and the charging standard. And, and that makes good sense from a perspective, although part of me also thinks that we have to look at the reality of what officers face and the fact that no other jobs really aside from law enforcement are required to, to really contend with people who may have hurt someone in the community and are trying to not be taken into custody. So with, with that said, uh, I really hope that we find a satisfying answer and do it quickly because we don't want a situation where a court interprets this and finds it to be that we've created because this is reasonable belief as opposed to simply belief or believes where the court might say, well, we know what this means in the federal context. We know what this means in uh, other contexts, but because this is here and this is Delaware law, we now have to interpret what this means. I think that it's beholden on us to make sure that if we have these concepts and we know what they mean, that we uh, make it consistent. And I, and I really don't want a scenario where the use of force in, uh, in a context in a more traditional way with something that is not uh, strangulation and, and where the use of force would be much more final, like with a firearm 
that 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 would not arise where we're somehow encouraging the reliance upon something like that as opposed to the reliance upon a uh, some sort of grappling maneuver that wouldn't be immediately deadly or wouldn't necessarily lead to death in the circumstances. So those are my thoughts. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the record being created. Uh, and I uh, do, again, want to emphasize that I very much agree with the overall concern of the bill uh, and the goal of making sure that we are uh, aggressively pursuing a resolution to this type of awful behavior. Um, if so noted, um, Senator, no, um, I'll go to Senator Lockman in a second. Senator, um, in this order, and I will go back to you, Senator Lockman, because I know you want to call back the witness who has sure. some clarification in yes. the interim, just so senators know so they don't physically have to be waving. Um, some are waving, some are using the keyboard. Um, we have Senator Hansen, then Senator Brown, then Senator McDowell has also raised their hands, but in courtesy to the last comment from Senator Del Calo, Senator Lachman now has clarity from our previous witness. Senator Lachman. Yes, thank you, Madam President. I'd like to request special privilege of the floor to bring back um, our Senate attorney, Frank Murphy. I believe he's got something Senator for Senator Del Calo on that point. Okay, personal privilege granted for Frank Murphy, and perhaps this might answer some person's hands who are up or not. Um, Mr. Murphy? Yeah, so first I wanted to address Senator Lawson. Senator Lawson, I, I looked for the Coleman case quickly, and unfortunately I, I could not find, uh, I found a Coleman v. State case, but I don't think it was the case you were talking about. So I, I'm sorry, I did my best to try to identify that case. Uh, on, the, uh, on the subject of the use of the term in the bill, <clears throat> reasonably believes. So... Uh, just so you understand, uh, these cases, civil and criminal cases, are all jury tried in the, typically jury tried in the Superior Court, and the Superior Court has standard pattern jury instructions. So when you have a civil or criminal trial, in this case it would be a criminal trial, you would go to the Superior Court standard criminal pattern jury instructions uh, to find uh, what the court would read to the jury in connection with uh, an offense involving uh, what a defendant believes. And we know from this, the way this statute is worded, we're talking about law enforcement officers, and it would be a case where a law enforcement officer was a defendant. And whether the statute says reasonable belief or belief uh, appears to be beside the point uh, in terms of the pattern jury instruction uh, that the Superior Court uses for uh, instructing a jury on a defendant's state of mind, in this case, the police officer. And so the jury instruction, it's jury instruction 2.5 uh, for Senator Del Calo's ease of reference. Uh, it, this is the, the standard instruction on state of mind, and it's a state of mind in a case where the defendant's belief is at issue. And it says, in, uh, you are permitted to draw an inference, or in other words, to reach a conclusion about a defendant's state of mind from the facts and circumstances. In reaching this conclusion, you may consider whether a reasonable person acting in the defendant's circumstances would have had or would not have had the required intention, knowledge, or belief. So, as I suggested, it, it appears that the pattern jury instruction uh, that the Superior Court would deliver on a defense uh, involving the state of mind of a defendant, uh, that it's going, the, the court is going to use the term, the terms, whether a reasonable person acting in the defendant's circumstances. So, uh, I, I hope, I believe that answers the question that Senator Alcala was most concerned about, and that's what it says. Okay, um, thank you with that. Um, what it will do is in the order, um, unless uh, Senator Alcala, you have something burning and succinct in response, since yeah, I mean, you had the most questions. Yeah, that was directly, just so that we don't lose the thread of that, because I know Mr. Murphy was kind enough to look that up, and I, I really appreciate that. Thank you, Madam President. Do you know if that jury instruction is the one generally for interpreting uh, 
the mens rea of a defendant or if that would be used in the affirmative defense context for this. And the reason I ask is I was looking in the same place you were, didn't find anything specifically about a pattern jury instruction for that affirmative defense. And I also know from experience that there was a pattern jury instruction provided uh, by the Third Circuit. There was actually a standing pattern jury instruction and then a uh, interpretation from uh, uh, Congress came along where they adjusted the law and, and then the pattern jury instruction sort of went out the door in that case. And that was actually litigated up to the Supreme Court of the United States on that uh, issue. So I, I certainly think the pattern jury instruction is helpful, but my question is, would our changing the law in some way you know, affect that? And then my second question is, does this pattern jury instruction go to just mens rea generally, or does it also, would it also apply to an affirmative defense? Well, it would have to apply to the defense because it, the question is about the defendant's state of mind. So that's what the defense is about. And when you're assessing a belief, you're assessing the state of mind. And this is the, the general instruction that's read in criminal cases where you're looking at the defendant's state of mind. And so, it, and it, it's, it, it, it's in a situation where you're just looking at the person's intention, knowledge. So you got those two parts or belief. So it, it covers the gamut of intentional crimes, crimes involving knowledge, but not intent and crimes that would uh, require uh, only a proof of belief. And it says whether a reasonable person acting in the defendant's circumstances. So it seems that the court would in every case uh, ask the jury to figure out uh, or make their determination based on what a, a reasonable person in the defendant's circumstances would have understood. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And again, in the order in which hands have been raised, we have Senator Hansen, Senator Brown, Senator McDowell. Um, and I know in the interest, we're doing okay. We have the other bills on the agenda, but I do know some members um, had indicated uh, seven o'clock or so. So we'll go to Senator Hansen. Thank you, Madam President. I just have a, um, a, a quick question for the sponsor. The concept of chokeholds and banning chokeholds has now been discussed for quite some time um, in, in our state. And I wanted to ask the sponsor if she's had um, anyone from the FOP reach out to her and express any objection to her bill. Or the concept. Uh, thank you, Senator Hansen. Um, I haven't had had outreach from law enforcement. I did personally reach out to them and had the opportunity to speak to President Calhoun with the FOP. Um, and, and he expressed, I think, what, what we're hearing over and over again is that this is not something that our law enforcement engages in, trains our, our officers in. Um, and, and that was my, my takeaway from our, our conversation. Thank you. Uh, Senator Brown. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I just want to lift my voice in support of the bill uh, this this afternoon or maybe this evening as time goes, al goes along. Um, wh what I want to emphasize is that as this bill, along with other bills, were announced two weeks ago, uh, there has been broad engagement, uh, not just within our, our community around public interest, uh, organizations, but also within law enforcement uh, and, and in those communications, both with, uh, with uh, Bracken and Calhoun, uh, we've had open dialogue about this bill uh, and, and their expression of support towards uh, the work that the Delaware Legislative Black Caucus is doing and what we presented. Uh, and so that is why uh, just a few hours ago, the Delaware House of Representatives supported this bill and voted unanimously 41-0 uh, in support of this legislation. And beyond partisanship, uh, it is my hope that this evening, uh, this chamber, this Senate chamber, which is supposed to be the upper chamber, uh, would be able to express to the public of Delaware those same sentiments that were expressed by the Delaware House of Representatives earlier today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. Uh, Senator McDowell. 
You have to thank, unmute yourself, sir. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I um, I had intended uh, to speak, but with the image of George Floyd in my head, I uh, I would not be able to be brief. Uh, I I think I would like to, the uh, last the words of Senator Brown be the worst last spoken of the day. So I will bypass. Thank you, sir. Senator Lockman. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'll be extremely brief. Glad to hear the universal uh, rejection of chokeholds as a practice uh, that we should see harming our, our citizens um, and hope to continue to, to, to have that not be a problem here in Delaware. Uh, so with that, I'd just like to ask for a roll call. Hey, under uh, suspension of rules, we are acting on House Bill 350. Madam Secretary, would you kindly call roll? Senator Bonini. Yes. Yes. Senator Brown. Yes. Yes. Senator Cloutier. Yes. Yes. Senator Del Colo. Yes. Yes. Senator Ennis. Senator, you need to unmute yourself, Senator Ennis. Senator Ennis. Here he comes, he has to unmute himself. He's trying. Senator, yes. go ahead. Yes. Senator Hansen. Yes. Yes. Senator Hawker. Senator Hawker, I think you're having a problem as well on muting. We can um, come back, sir, or you can indicate to me. <laughs> Here we are. Senator Hawker, you're unmuted. No. Senator Hawker, no. Senator Lawson? Unfortunately, no. No. Senator Lockman? Yes. Yes. Senator Lopez. Yes. Yes. Senator McBride. Yes. Yes. Senator McDowell. Yes. Yes. Senator Pardee. Yes. Yes. Senator Pettyjohn. No. No. Senator Poor. Yes. Yes. Senator Richardson. No. No. Senator Sokola. Yes. Yes. Senator Sturgeon. Yes. Yes. Senator Townsend. Yes. Yes. Senator Walsh. Yes. Yes. Senator Wilson. No. No. Madam President, the roll call on House Bill 350, 16 yes and 5 no. Having received the required and sufficient number of votes, House Bill 350 declared passed the Senate. Senator Poor. Thank you, Madam President. At this time, I am going to yield to Senator McDowell for Senate Bill 260. Uh, Senator McDowell, sir. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I respectfully request that at this time, Senate Bill 260 uh, be read in and brought before the Senate for consideration. I also ask that any necessary rules be suspended for the purpose of working on Senate Bill 260. So noted, sir, under suspension of the rules, Mr. Assistant Secretary, would you kindly read in title only Senate Bill 260s? Remember, this is a three quarters vote. Senate Bill number 260, sponsored by Senator McDowell, Senator Ennis, Senator Party, Senator Sturgeon, Senator Lawson, Senator Richardson, and Representative Hugh Johnson, Representative Bolden, Representative Carson, Representative Gakes, Representative Briggs King, Representative Hensley. An act making appropriations for certain grants and aid for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021, specifying certain procedures, conditions, and limitations for the expenditure of such funds, amending the fiscal year 2021 Appropriations Act and amending certain statutory provisions. 
Madam President, this concludes the reading of Senate Bill number 260 by title only. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, we had a little technology issue here on our end. Um, Senator McDowell, um, to you, sir, we're on Senate Bill 260 under suspension of rules. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Senate Bill 260 is exactly uh, the same as the previous bill, Senate Bill 241. Uh, it, it is identical in every portion, except it has a front that has the number 260 instead of 241. Uh, so everything has remained the same. I'll give a, a, a brief rundown on uh, what, what we've done in this year's grant and aid. Uh, as you know, it was a difficult year. I, I don't have to redo all that because we did it before. But I would tell you that the uh, on the front page that we have uh, the uh, amount that goes to the county seat package of three three million eight hundred eighty thousand five hundred forty three. Um, there's also on that same page, emergency medical services and the paramedic, uh, paramedic program operations, uh, which is a total of 13,265,320. Uh, to that, of that number, uh, just under a million dollars is the increase to the paramedic program. Um, as you know, there are a lot of lines to go through in this, um, I'm going to uh, go, though, in the interest of expediency uh, to the last lines. Uh, and if you like, you can check to see that they were, um, uh, they, they, they were the same on the other bill. Uh, we have uh, on, on, on page uh, 50 of 50, uh, line uh, 15, section 1, government units and senior centers. 26,692,375. Section two, one times in community agencies, 20,467,399. Um, fire companies, total was 6,940,706. Veterans organizations, 354,318 uh, dollars. And uh, grand total, of the grant aid budget is 54,454,798. Madam President, um, that, uh, that uh, is the grant aid budget for FY 2021. I'll be glad to answer any questions and I hope that we have Mike Morton standing by somewhere in this uh, Zoom land yes. uh, to help me out if I need it. Yep. And I was told earlier he was there. And uh, at this point, I only see one hand raised. I should start keeping score, but I haven't. Senator Del Calo <laughs> and then Senator Bonini, Senator Del Calo, and then Senator Lawson. So Senator Del Calo, Bonini, Lawson. Okay. Senator Del Calo. I think I might be winning that uh, informal tally. <laughs> you are right now. <laughs> yeah. there you go. Uh, so I just wanted to take a moment to thank um, two of my colleagues, as well as the members of leadership uh, in both chambers, um, in particular, Senator Walsh and Representative Williams, um, there was an issue brought to my attention after the uh, uh, grant and aid bill did not proceed yesterday. And that involved a, uh, a move that was made uh, to remove funding from a nonprofit that actually focuses on addiction treatment. Uh, in the Newport area. And that nonprofit is actually run by a young woman that I'm sure many of you are familiar with who is uh, in recovery herself. And the work she does is quite incredible. Uh, and I can say very much needed for the area that it's in, uh, sort of right in the heart of that Newport, Stanton, Ellesmere area. So the reason I'm thanking uh, the folks that I mentioned, and I also wanted to thank uh, Senator Poor as well as uh, Representative Longhurst is because I know that there was a full court press and an effort made to correct that. And I understand that it was in fact corrected. Um, so I, I just wanted to point out that uh, the idea of proceeding uh, carefully uh, and, and certainly temperately and prudently here 
provided some pivotal space to allow the type of bipartisan work that I think is the hallmark of our state to uh, rise to the forefront. Uh, and it did so in a manner here that meant an, a tremendous amount to a very important uh, champion uh, of uh, this addiction issue in my area. I do wanna give a shout out to her because I know she's watching at home. Her name is Erin uh, Goldner. She is excellent. Uh, and, and so that's, that's what I wanted to point out and just say and express my uh, unabashed thanks for that. Uh, I do have, however, have a question and maybe this is relevant to uh, Mr. Morton uh, and, and it's, it's more so in reference to how we proceeded with this, because I know that the uh, grant and aid bill, but for the change in the number, is the same. So my question was, uh, if it's the same, and I know also for a fact that, uh, Hope, that Hope Street is getting the funding that they had had before, is, is where that funding is coming from and how that just works from a technical standpoint, because I know it's there, but I also know that the bill is unchanged, and I wondered if Mr. Morton could elucidate that point for me. Uh, yes. Uh, Mike, uh, yes, personal privilege is granted to Mike Morton. Mike, for the record, you can say your name and title, please. Uh, yes, uh, Mike Morton, Controller General. Uh, yes, Senator, uh, given the discussions that I've had with the uh, chairs of the Joint Finance Committee and uh, given the intent of the General Assembly over the past couple of days, uh, I have uh, discussed with uh, Director Jackson of OMB. Uh, our intent is to take $5,000 of uh, carryover money uh, from FY20 into 21, which is, is simply carryover money. It's unencumbered. Uh, and use that carryover money to uh, uh, to transfer five thousand dollars to uh, Hope Street. So that is the mechanism by which the uh, the intent of the General Assembly will be accomplished. Controller General, thank you so much for outlining that for me. I wasn't exactly aware of all the details. I just knew uh, from speaking to Miss Goldner, and I can tell you she is deeply appreciative of this. Uh, more than I can probably express uh, from speaking to her at length earlier today. So I'm glad that I know the mechanism of how that is there and that we've got that in the record. Uh, I want to express also my appreciation to your office and uh, OMB for that, for making that happen. Uh, and I just want to thank my colleagues uh, again, because uh, this sort of stuff doesn't get done with all of your support. And um, you know, I do very much appreciate having had the time to, to do this work, and um, I look forward to supporting a very, very pivotal measure, uh, which is this grant and aid bill. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam President. Okay. Senator Bonini. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And if I may, if I could do a quick follow-up to, yes. to Senator Del Colo and, and, and poor Mike. I'm going to ask, ask Mike. So you're uh, asking so if I can have personal privilege of the floor for Mike. Morton he's again. still he is still with us. Um, okay, Th thank you. Yes, Madam. personal privilege. So you can go directly to the controller you. general. Yep. Thank you. Hey, hey Mike, is, and uh, thanks for all you do, of course. Um, so when we pass a budget, the budget the budget incorporates the unincorporated the uh, unencumbered money that comes in the next year as part of our revenue estimate, I think. And when we pass grant and aid or the bond bill, the bond because of debt, but grant and aid is a three quarters bill because uh, giving, giving grants away to private or nonprofit uh, or you know, business, quite frankly, companies requires a three quarters bill according to the Consti uh, constitution. So I guess my question is I am, Great that 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 uh, Senator Del Colo's nonprofit. It sounds like it does great work. Very obviously very supportive. Um, but I guess I'm a little unclear on that mechanism uh, of of we can just decide to give money uh, to a nonprofit. My assumption was that required a three quarter vote, which of course I would be happy to support. Um. I, I am using uh, the the authority from uh, both the, the budget director and myself uh, to use uh, again carryover money to transfer that into an existing appropriate appropriation. Uh, I, again, the the idea that we uh, 
we typically do not amend the money bills on the floor. Uh, that causes uh, problems in, uh, in and of itself. So the mechanism that we're, we're uh, doing here is, is uh, our means of uh, solving a problem given the intent of the General Assembly over the past couple of days. Uh, uh, Madam President, and I, I appreciate so it. Oh, thank you, Madam President. And I appreciate it. I don't don't think we should be amending the, the trying to amend the money bills on the on the floor. That would <laughs> we would be here a long time, Mike. <laughs> so, um, uh, but I guess so. How much carryover money is there? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but uh, but part of the uh, the uh, uh, financial package that we have in front of us, we're carrying over $181 million in unencumbered cash balance. Obviously, not all of that is uh, carryover money from the budget from one year to the other. I, I, I'll i take a, a wild guess. You're probably talking uh, carryover money, uh, 40 to $50 million that is uh, maybe unencumbered or encumbered in any given year. Uh, just as a matter of fact that monies are not spent going from one year to the next, uh, knowing that they will be, but they were uh, obligations from the prior year and we need to carry them over. So uh, it's 5,000 and all this is not a large- Oh, no, no, and, and I, Mike, I absolutely understand it. I'm very supportive. I just I just didn't want us to run into trouble because I was under the, the impression that even a penny uh, given out required a three quarters vote, but but and I won't and I won't press it anymore. But thank you, thank you, and Madam President, thanks, Mike, and Madam President. I did have a question about the bill in, in general, but I can hold that. I, I need to see if anyone else has questions for the witness, so the witness thanks. can be excused. Uh, Senator Walsh, do you have a question of the witness, sir? Uh, I, I do not have a question. I just have a. Okay, so the witness can then uh, be excused. And uh, again, this is a three quarters vote, um, getting back to the last dialogue. But next, uh, we will go to uh, Ma Senator Madam Lawson. President, yes, Madam yes. President, I, I apologize, Madam President. I, I had a question for the sponsor. Okay, sir, I'm sorry. No, no, I, it's, I, I apologize. I should have made that made that clear. Okay. So, so Senator Benini, then Senator Lawson, then Senator Walsh. Uh, okay. thank, thank, thank you, Madam President. So we are establishing two... Uh, entities in the grant and aid bill, uh, one on, on issues involving a a African Americans and another on which we just spent a fair amount of time on. Um, so, to lack of a better term, Senator McDowell, please correct me, but civilian oversight of of, of police agencies. And and I guess my very blunt question is, why the heck are we doing this in the back of the grant and aid bill? Um, and you know, I, I guess if we, if you could address that. Well, I, I'll, I'll uh, ask for some help from uh, Mr. Morton at the same uh, again, but uh, I think the, uh, the basic answer is that the Grand Abel was the only thing open, only place to, to put it. It was uh, uh, not, not covered in the budget and uh, uh, it, there was a strong support for it. So it was voted in Grand Abel. Thank you, Madam President, if I may. And, and you know, and I, and I think there is strong support for it and, and don't necessarily have an issue with it, but, but, but it was kind of surprising to see it in the back of Granite 8, just to be, to be clear. And, and I, and I do think that those. Well, those... well I can, I can tell you something else that's in the Granite 8 that is pretty much the same category. We, we uh, uh, got the money for the steps and the collective bargaining agreement raises. Uh, and put that in grant aid to uh, make sure that right. that well and madam uh, president if i may i mean yes. and, and those things are money things that require a, a uh i mean and i i understand we've done that we do that frequently with with sort of catch-up items of the budget and things like that and i certainly understand that but these are substantive policy issues not dealing with finances necessarily and 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 quite frankly I mean, I don't want to hold up the Senate, so Madam President, you know, and I have some faith because I, in, in what's going on, but, but I'd really like to know how these, how they work, what their, what the plans are for them, are they going to cost any, how much money they're going to cost us, um, you know, uh, what's the makeup, specific makeup of these? These are not trivial, trivial entities we're creating, and 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 Madam President, I won't, you know, hold up the Senate 
trying to find those things out, but I, but I just, I'd really much prefer if we had a chance to really to talk about those things. And um, so I just, I just, I just am very, a little disappointed that, that that stuff is sort of in the back of the, uh, the grant and aid bill and not out here in, in front individually and quite frankly, going to support them, but I would, would like to have the opportunity to really get a sense of what exactly we're creating. Well, okay, the again, next comments um, were from, again, I just Sen oh, I'm sorry, Senator McDowell, I was going to the next speaker. Sorry, just Senator McDowell. To, just, to, just to put your mind at ease, these were brought up, duly brought up before the committee and the committee uh, talked about it and uh, took a vote. I believe, uh, I believe the vote was unanimous. And, and, and Madam President, I, yes. uh, that, uh, thank you very much. And I, I mean, that, that's great. And I have faith in my colleagues in the, you know, the committee, but, but I think, Senator, I think you understand my point. I think this, this could have been, you know, I think these are things that should have been brought to the, to the whole Senate. And, uh, but thank, uh, thank you. And, and, and uh, Senator McDowell, thanks very much. Okay. Um, Senator Lawson, sir, I believe you've been waiting. And Senator Walsh. I, my questions have been answered. Thank you. Great. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I thank Senator Del Calo for those kind words. And um, we did write letters to the chairs of the, uh, of the uh, budget committee, but I would like to say that the lead here was really Representative Williams. Um, she was on this from the beginning and noticed it. And I don't wanna say we were just tag-ons, but we were just tag-ons on this. <laughs> um, so we did, we do thank the committee. We did think uh, that this was coming out. We did find this error. We were, we were under the understanding that everything was going to remain the same for whatever reason. reason. She, uh, she did not, Aaron Goldner of Hope Street, we found did not get that $5,000. And uh, uh, immediately we, we went to the chairs and to some of the subcommittees and we, all three of us wrote letters and, uh, Aaron does a lot for the community, uh, for the shared community that we have in Newport. She does a first responders day every year in Newport. And while $5,000 may not seem a lot, it, it's a lot to her. And she, she is really, really appreciative of this. And I'm glad to see, I thought monies were gonna be shifted around uh, in, in the grant aid, but I guess that couldn't be done. And I appreciate uh, Controller Morton for being able to find, find the money in the encumbered funds to to take care of this because she really is a dedicated person you've all seen her down there every day we're in session and uh once again i really would like to thank uh representative kim, kim williams for this there was some uh some dialogue going back and forth and i just want to make sure she gets the credit because uh she was the lead in in, in taking this on so thank you you have that uh very much so um Next in line, uh, I don't see anyone else, believe it or not. Oh, Senator Cloutier, <laughs> I'll be almost to the roll call. Senator, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. Uh, being a past member of the Joint Finance for many years, I do appreciate all the hard work everyone put in the many long hours. And I did vote yes, as you know, on Tuesday, I will be voting yes again, and I'm hoping my colleagues will help pass this bill. Thank you. That's pretty good for a roll call. <laughs> Madam Secretary, would you kindly call roll on Senate Bill 260, three quarters vote required. Thank you. Senator Fernini. Yes, sorry. Yes. Senator Brown. Yes. Yes. Senator Cloutier. Yes. Yes. Senator Del Colo. Yes. Yes. Senator Ennis. Yep. Yes. Senator Hansen. Yes. Yes. Senator Hawker. Yes. Yes. Senator Lawson. Yes. Yes. Senator Lockman. Yes. Yes. Senator Lopez. Yes. Yes. Senator McBride. Yes. Yes. Senator McDowell. Yes. Yes. Senator Pardee. Yes. Yes. Senator Pettyjohn. Yes. Yes. Senator Poor. Yes. Yes. 
Senator Richardson. Yes. Yes. Senator Sokola. Yes. Yes. Senator Sturgeon. Yes. Yes. Senator Townsend. Yes. Yes. Senator Walsh. Yes. Yes. Senator Wilson. Yes. Yes. Madam President, the roll call on Senate Bill 260, 21 yes. Having received the required and sufficient number of votes, Senate Bill 260 declared passed the Senate. Senator Poor. Thank you, Madam President. At this time, I'm going to yield to Senator Townsend for Senate Bill 242. Senator Townsend. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Poor. As a member, having cast a vote on the prevailing side on um, Senate Bill 242, I move for reconsideration. So noted. Um, Assistant Secretary, would you kindly read title only Senate Bill 242, please? Senate Bill number 242, sponsored by Senator Sokola, Senator Brown, Senator Townsend, Senator Walsh, Senator Benini, Senator Pettyjohn, and Representative Heppard and Representative Brady, Representative Bosinski, Representative Kay Williams, Representative Gray, Representative Ramon. A bond and capital improvements act of the state of Delaware and certain of its authorities for the fiscal year. Madam President. Yes, Senator Zicola. May so much be considered the reading of the title of the capital improvement bill. So noted, thank you, Senator Sokola for that. And then now we have before us, seeing no objections to the recension, we have now before us uh, Senate Bill 242. So Senator Sokola, please. Thank you, Madam President. I motion that the uh, roll call on Senate Bill 242 be rescinded. So noted, we would like to take roll call now on the recension of Senate Bill 242, which will then allow us to have action and go forward with dialogue. So for the new members, I think this might be your first recension you've participated with, or maybe not last year we had one. So uh, Madam Secretary, would you kindly call roll on the recension of the roll call, which will allow us, a yes vote will allow us to act on the bill. Madam Secretary. Senator Benini, have we lost you, sir? Unmute yourself, you're muted. Uh, Madam President, I had not heard a roll call. Um, we Benini. have not done a roll call. We were calling for the recension. If you vote yes, that means we're rescinding the vote, the prior roll call, which had failed. If you vote to rescind, we will now be able to have dialogue about the bond bill. So a yes vote supports the... Okay, so I did not hear the secretary ask for a roll call. But okay. I'm, Madam Secretary, will you kindly call? Walt? So I, I apologize if I missed that. Senator Benini. Yes. Yes. Senator Brown. Yes. Yes. Senator Poutier. Yes. Yes. Senator Del Colo. Yes. Yes. Senator Ennis. Yes. Yes. Senator Hansen. Yes. Yes. Senator Hawker. Yes. Yes. Senator Lawson. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Senator Lockman. Yes. Yes. Senator Lopez. Yes. Yes. Senator McBride. Yes. Yes. Senator McDowell. Yes. Yes. Senator Pardee. Yes. Yes. Senator Pettyjohn. Yes. Yes. Senator Poor. Yes. Yes. Senator Richardson. Yes. Yes. Senator Sokola. Yes. Yes. Senator Sturgeon. Yes. Yes. Senator Townsend. Yes. Yes. Senator Walsh. Yes. Yes. Senator Wilson. Yes. Yes. Madam President, roll call on Senate Bill 242, 21 yes. Having received the required and sufficient number of votes, Senate Bill 242 is now rescinded and we have dialogue before us for action. Senator Sokola. 
Thank you, Madam President. I, I gave a summary the other day on uh, the areas in K-12 uh, public education, higher education capital investments, uh, statewide infrastructure and maintenance support, environmental and agricultural support, and housing and economic development projects. Um, one thing I did neglect to say that, uh, that I should have, because they're always a very active group during the bond bill hearings, is uh, we did also support uh, library projects uh, with the state share uh, for the Selbyville Public Library and the Rehoboth Public Library. And uh, if anybody needs a summary, it, it is um, for the total transportation authorization, $363.5 million. For total other authorizations, $344.3 million and a total of $707.953 million. So uh, under rather difficult circumstances, we were able to come uh, with what I consider to be still some pretty ambitious uh, commitments. And hopefully these will put uh, a lot of people to work and help our economy get back to, to where we want it to be. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Uh, okay. Senator McDowell. Thank you, Dave. I, I don't have any questions. I just want to give a big kudos and shout shout out to Dave Sicola, Senator Sicola, and the members of the bond committee. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I Senator Benini's hand, and then Senator Del Colo. Senator Benini. Yeah, uh, thank you. And, and just a, a, a quick follow up with Senator Sicola, and I think we had had this conversation in committee. But there is uh, a possibility, uh, I would say it's a probability that there's going to be a significant source, uh, a si significant amount of revenue coming from Washington to the states um, sometime soon, Mike, uh, you know, obviously, who knows what they do in Washington, right? But, but, uh, and we had a brief discussion in bond about when that money comes, it would go back to the legislature to help uh, decide the uh, the prior the priorities and where that money would be used. Is that is that your understanding, as opposed to just simply? Uh, I mean, the legislature is going to have an opportunity to to weigh in on those decisions. That is my understanding. Um, the um... You know, the, the GRB that was introduced in um, January was quite a bit more ambitious than this. <laughs> and, um, and, and I would expect that, um, that we would have a, a healthy discussion if we did get some flexibility with respect to CARES Act money or a subsequent act that did give us uh, directly more state aid. Uh, that would be my understanding. Okay, so we, so we would have a chance if that were to happen, we would have a chance to, to go back in and and, uh, and work on the priorities as outlined in the prior bond bill and whatever else. I, I, I don't see why not. <laughs> okay, well, I do. Well, and I apologize, Senator Mike and Madam President, I apologize, because my question is, I mean, I, just, I, I you know, if, if that does happen, we're not going to be in session, right? So, although we're kind of not in session anyway, right? <laughs> With a virtual, I get it. <laughs> but but my, my my point is that as opposed to that money simply going in into the administration, that that, that I, I think it's critical that the, led, the legislative branch, who I believe are closest to the people, have the opportunity to to weigh in on that. And and I think, and I'm just sort of following up quite like with Senator Sicola. I think Budget Director Jackson was very clear that that would be the case, uh, and very thankful for that for that comment. But I just wanted to verify that was your understanding as well. It's my understanding, and and it's clear that um, other states have had to make significant cuts and some are going to actually go back into special session to make further cuts so and that's one of the reasons why there's such a broad push from at the state level to get the feds to give us more flexibility or more resources and uh and i think that um it's going to be very um interesting to see exactly what happens and and uh and when we get, get an opportunity to, to reconsider some of these things um, you know, there's certainly a possibility that um, that we could be doing that uh, modification mid midstream, whether it's between now and election day, or between now and January, or or once we get back into January, modifying the current year's budget. But uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, potential there, and it really depends on when and exactly how uh, the congressional level of activity occurs. 
Right. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Scola. But, um, I don't see any other comments, so we will go to roll call with. Madam President, Senate. I ask for a roll call. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I'm moving you right along. Um, that is the joy of the virtual world. Uh, I see Secretary, it. Would you, uh, oh, Senator Del Calo had his hand up. Are we okay, Senator Del Calo? Or yeah, I just uh, wanted to very briefly uh, thank Dave and uh, the other members of the of the capital improvement and bond committee for all the work they did. Uh, now that there's been an opportunity to, to fully digest all of their work, I look forward very much to supporting this. And I also wanna point out that uh, part of the reason that Delaware has, has been able to not have the level of cuts and, and part of the reason that we are in a good situation is actually because of something that Senator Sokola, our uh, intrepid chair of the bond committee has supported, which is our budget stabilization fund, which I think has allowed the bond committee to do a lot of its good work. And, and frankly, also JFC uh, generally as well on the grant and aid bill. So it's certainly something that I hope we continue to discuss down the line, because I think we've seen that by having that type of fiscally responsible uh, control in place, that it's really benefited us incredibly well to weather an unprecedented event, the literal sort of meteor falling from the sky that we were able to stave off some pretty bad results here. And it was because of that. And I remember working with uh, Senator McDowell on that task force that recommended the concept. So it, I, re I really just wanted to make a note of that. And again, thank Senator Sokola for all of his hard work on this. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, Senator Sokola. You're Madam President, I would please ask for a roll call. Madam Secretary, would you kindly call a roll on Senate Bill 242, please? Senator Bernini. Yes. Yes. Senator Brown. Yes. Yes. Senator Cloutier. Yes. Yes. Senator Del Colo. Yes. Yes. Senator Ennis. Yes. Yes. Senator Hansen. Yes. Yes. Senator Hawker. Yes. Yes. Senator Lawson. Yes. Yes. Senator Lockman. Yes. Yes. Senator Lopez. Yes. Yes. Senator McBride. Yes. Yes. Senator McDowell. Yes. Yes. Senator Pardee. Yes. Yes. Senator Pettyjohn. Yes. Yes. Senator Poor. Yes. Senator Richardson. Yes. Yes. Senator Sokola. Yes. Yes. Senator Sturgeon. Yes. Yes. Senator Townsend. Yes. Yes. Senator Walsh. Yes. Yes. Senator Wilson. Yes. Yes. Madam President, the roll call on Senate Bill 242, 21 yes. Having received the required sufficient number of votes, Senate Bill number 242 would declare pass the Senate. Senator Poor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I ask that consent agenda number five be brought before the Senate for consideration under suspension of rules. Um, and I would also like to add that uh, the bills on this agenda have been reviewed by both members of the caucuses. So if you could kindly read that in. Yes, we will. Under suspension of rules, Mr. Assistant Secretary, will you kindly read in consent agenda number five and note that uh, one of the bills is three-fifths, so it will require three-fifths vote. Mr. Secretary. Senate consent agenda number five, House Bill number 354, sponsored by Representative Bennett, Representative Griffith, Senator Sicola, and others, an act to amend Title 16 of the Delaware Code relating to death certificates. House Bill number 355, sponsored by Representative Kay Johnson and Senator McBride, an act to amend Title 29 of the Delaware Code relating to the Department of Health and Social Services. House Bill number 353, sponsored by Representative Osinski and Senator Walsh, an act to amend Title 19 relating to, to non-charging of COVID-19 related unemployment benefits to employers. House Bill number 351, 
sponsored by Representative Osinski and Senator Walsh, an act to amend titles 29 and 19 of the Delaware Code relating to unemployment compensation in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. House Bill number 352, sponsored by Representative Osinski and Senator Walsh, an act to amend title 29 of the Delaware Code relating to the powers of the Delaware Secretary of Labor related to unemployment compensation in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. House substitute number one with House Amendment one for House Bill number 348, sponsored by Representative Bentz and Senator Townsend, an act to amend titles 18 and 24 of the Delaware Code relating to telemedicine services. Madam President, that concludes the reading of Senate Consent Agenda number five. Madam Senator, Majority Leader Poor, on our last item, I believe, of the evening, we're coming to you on our Consent Agenda number five. Thank you, Madam President. If there are no questions, I ask for a roll call. Madam Secretary, would you kindly call roll on consent agenda item number five? Senator Panini. Yes. Yes. Senator Brown. Yes. Yes. Senator Cloutier. Yes. Yes. Senator Del Polo. Yes. Yes. Senator Ennis. Senator Ennis, you need to unmute. I heard your, I can do. Senator Ennis, there you go. Yep. You're, yes. Yes. Senator Hansen. Yes. Yes. Senator Hawker. Yes. Yes. Senator Lawson. Yes. Yes. Senator Lockman. Yes. Yes. Senator Lopez. Yes. Yes. Senator McBride. Yes. Yes. Senator McDowell. Yes. Yes. Senator Pardee. Yes. Yes. Senator Pettyjohn. Yes. Yes. Senator Poor. Yes. Yes. Senator Richardson. Yes. Yes. Senator Sicola. Yes. Yes. Senator Sturgeon. Yes. Yes. Senator Townsend. Yes. Yes. Senator Walsh. Yes. Yes. Senator Wilson. Yes. Yes. Madam President, the roll call on set agenda five containing House bills 354, 355, 353, 351, 352, and House Substitute 1 for House Bill 348 as amended by House Amendment 1, 21 yes. Having received the requiring sufficient number of votes, consent agenda five declared passed the Senate. Senator Poor. Thank you, Madam President. At this time, I ask, are there any announcements? If no announcements, then I move the session conducted in virtual format, stand in recess until Tuesday um, to the call of the President pro tem. Hearing no objections, the Senate will stand in recess. Be safe. Remember to stay online. <laughs>